think we're about ready to get started. Are we ready to go? Okay. Well, you know what? I think before we even call the meeting to order, we do the prayer of the pledge. We just sing, Gene, happy birthday. We might as well, we were just talking about it. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Gene. Happy birthday to you and many more. Happy birthday. Yeah. There you go. last year, too, on Council Night. Really? Because they observed yesterday as the fourth. There you go. So nowhere I'd rather be than with you all. So we really wish you a happy birthday. We're out by 9 o'clock. Let's do it. Okay. We're on. Well, I want to thank Craig Hansen for coming tonight and opening us in prayer. And Craig, I just want to say thank you that you're here every Tuesday at noon, that you pray with others on Tuesdays for our city and for the elected officials, but for our entire community. Thank you so much for your leadership and thank you for that prayer. So we'll let you come forward, open us in prayer and the pledge. Well, goodness. I forget which do I start with, the prayer or the pledge? Let's do prayer first. <laughs> All right, we'll do that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I do want to just share a quick, quick scripture, I promise. And, you know, one of the things I will just say is the, the uh, I won't call it a spirit, but the levity that is here tonight uh, amongst everybody just uh, joking around, that is a good thing to see in our, our city leaders as they enjoy being here. And I hope that each one of the individuals out here can have that same kind of heart and attitude tonight. Uh, so here, here's this quick scripture, I promise. Yet in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And uh, I think that that's why we have joy is because of the love of Christ that we can share with one another. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you so much for this council and for the mayor, for their leadership. And as Lord God, they seek proper direction and dear Lord God, making proper decisions that will benefit the citizens of Nampa. May you guide them, direct them. And Lord God, I thank you again for the lightheartedness that they have tonight. And I pray that that will continue even as they work hard to accomplish the business of the city, may they, dear Lord God, trust in you because you will not separate them from your love. And that is the same for everyone in our city. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I appreciate Pastor Craig's comments. And uh, you know what? And I, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I so appreciate the fact that as leaders, the council members, and the same is true of our employees, we don't always agree, but we respect one another and we can disagree respectfully and enjoy working together. And so it is a wonderful thing and uh, the same is true of our staff. So how we treat one another is with respect and honor. And, um, but we also speak truth, and that's important. So I appreciated those comments. And with that, we'll get started, and we'll start with roll call. Rodriguez? Here. Bruner? Here. Butchie? Here. Levi? Present. Haverfield? Here. Bauer? Here. I am not aware of any proposed amendments to the agenda. Is anyone else aware of any proposed amendments tonight? Seeing none, I would stand for a motion to approve the consent agenda as and the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Bruner? Yes. Levi? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Muchie? Yes. Everfield? Yes. The next item on the agenda are our proclamations, and we have two proclamations. The first one is our Snake River Stampede Days proclamation, and I'll do that one first. And unfortunately, tonight is a Snake River board, a Stampede Board meeting, so they are busy working on the details of the rodeo, so they're unable to be here, but we didn't want to miss the opportunity to read the proclamation. 
Whereas in 1915, the first Nampa Harvest Festival, also known as Snake River Stampede, kicked off the first rodeo event. And whereas since that date in 1915, the Snake River Stampede Rodeo has become one of the premier rodeos in the state of Idaho in the United States. And whereas the Snake River Stampede attracts over 60,000 spectators each year from across the state and around the world that enjoy rodeo in Nampa, Idaho. And whereas the Snake River Stampede is considered as one of the top PRCA indoor rodeos in the nation, and whereas our community gets to observe over 700 world-ranking contestants competing for over $450,000 in prize money, whereas the rodeo is celebrating the 160th year as the wildest, fastest show on earth. Now, therefore, I, Debbie Kling, Mayor of the City of Nampa, Idaho, do hereby proclaim July 12th through the 24th in the city of Nampa as Snake River Stampede Days. We encourage our citizens to promote the exciting community celebration and to wear Western apparel. So I need to remind employees the week of the stampede, we need to wear jeans and cowboy boots. So I look forward to that. So what's that? Not skinny jeans. <laughs> Boot cut jeans with cowboy boots. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm excited. You know what? We have an amazing rodeo. What are you smiling at? I missed that joke over there. Well, they said no skinny cut jeans. I thought, oh boy, you don't see me in that. <laughs> <laughs> no way, man. Uh, our other proclamation this evening, and Darren, I'm not sure who's going to actually come forward. Jennifer is. So um, you know what? I can read the proclamation unless you would like the honor of reading it. Okay, so I'll read it and then I'll hand it to you. So uh, it is Parks and Recreation Month. And whereas Parks and Recreation programs are an integral part of communities across this country, including Nampa, and whereas... And whereas we're there we go. go. Whereas right. our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities ensuring the health of all citizens, and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of our community and region. And whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and they improve the mental and emotional health of our citizens. And whereas the parks and rec programs increase the community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. And whereas parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community. And whereas parks and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect ground cover, prevent flooding, improve the quality of air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife. Whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors. And whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month. Nampa therefore recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation resources. Now, therefore, I, Debbie Clean Mayor of the City of Nampa, do hereby proclaim July 2021 to be Parks and Recreation Month. Jennifer, do you have something you'd like to share with us? And I'll give you the official proclamation. There you go. Thank you. And I appreciate our team here. Courtney's here and Darren. Do we have anybody else here from Parks? I don't think so. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for reading that. Thank you for declaring July as National Parks and Recreation Mayor and City Council. Thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, this proclamation is an initiative of the National Parks and Recreation Association to celebrate and acknowledge all the ways that parks and recreation has the power to transform our daily lives, from providing us places to play, get fit, and stay healthy, to fostering new relationships and forging a connection with nature. Our close-to-home community park and recreation facilities provide essential services and improve our quality of life. Nampa Parks and Recreation Facilities are a place where people can gather and participate in wholesome activities and have fun. By increasing our awareness of parks and recreation amenities and programs in Nampa, play and activity will increase, leading to ultimately leading to a healthier community. 
We strive to provide amenities that will encourage people to get active, create community, and make Nampa a great place to live. This year, Nampa Parks and Recreation is offering pop-up giveaways throughout the month to celebrate July as National Parks and Rec Month. The goal is to highlight some of our great programs and amenities available through Park, Nampa Parks and Recreation. Our first pop-up event will be this Thursday during our traveling playground at Sunset Oaks Park and Maplewood Park. We'll be handing out free goodie bags to the kids who come out to the park to join the traveling playground. For those of you who don't know, the traveling playground is a great program that we offer every summer. Um, we go to area parks in Nampa and run organized play with the kids in the community. The goal is to meet kids that may not have the ability to access transportation for programming throughout the summer. We also work in conjunction with the Summer Oasis feeding program so kids who come out to the park have free lunch and then join us for organized play. We're excited to highlight this great program as well as other pop-ups throughout the month. We also have some great um, exciting projects that are taking place throughout the park system coming up very soon. An outdoor gym is currently being installed at Maple Grove Park. It, a large playground is just weeks away from opening at Brant Park and we are in the planning phase of a second dog park in Nampa. Thank you for allowing me to share. Do you have any questions or comments? I would just like to say thank you. You know, what you're doing with those pop-up, little pop-up parks and the traveling playground is incredible. Yeah. It's needed, it's important. Thank you for the vision and the work that you guys do that make our whole park system really something treasured in our community. So I just really appreciate your work. Thank you. And I tell you one thing that we may not all know, the longevity of staff. <laughs> when I was visiting the other day with this team, I was listening to how long many of them have been with the city and the great work that they do and how much they're appreciated by all the people that work with them in their various areas. And it's pretty cool. I just, you know, it's, I'm really proud of you guys and the great work that you do and the team that you have. And so thank you for everything. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks. So the next item on our agenda is the Nampa residents wishing to speak on an agenda or non-agenda item. Do we have anyone signed up, Debbie? Uh, Margie Potter. Hi, Margie. Yes, of course, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Welcome. Go ahead and state your name and address for the record. Uh, Margie Potter with the Salvation Army at 403 12th Avenue South. And nothing bad tonight, but Mary, you kind of took my thunder away. Because I just wanted to say to you and to council and the city staff um, how um, great you guys have been working with agencies and people that are concerned about you know the housing situation in uh, our community in Nampa and uh, how we don't always agree on everything um, but we are always willing to talk about it. You guys all came, we invited every council member, and we're still gonna to talk to you, <laughs> um, to come out and just hear us out and see kind of what the problems are. And every single one of you was willing to, you know, answered right back and was willing to come out and, uh, and talk to several of the agencies um, and, you know, people in our community, like the school district and Salvation Army and Catch and, um, places like that, and um, and the planning and planning and zoning has been awesome. They invited us, or we explained some things to us, and we kind of told them some of our concerns as well. Um, you know, sometimes the in the in public, or in, I want I don't want to hate saying the media because everybody it's it's not all bad, but. Uh, they don't hear all the story, and they don't hear that we're get we do are working things out that kind of leans on one side, like you know it's us against them, and it's I don't feel like that it's here in our city. I feel like everybody's willing to um, work together, but we do have a problem, and we do need to do something about it. And I'm going to keep coming up and saying <laughs> something about it every time. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that the sit this council has. Um, given some support to the shelter that's allowed us to stay open, the community family shelter that's allowed us to stay open till it'll be like the beginning of 2023, which gives us some time to get 
um, you know, our feet under us to find some other means of um, keeping that open. And we're just about ready to open all the rooms full because we were half the rooms were open because of COVID. So, um, but now we're we're ready to open them up fully with the um, uh, direction of Southwest District Health. So. Um, I just want to thank you guys for working together, and especially you, I want, uh, Mayor, because um, you have spoken out a few times and not always gotten the best um, reception from the audience, and that's got to be super hard, but I respect you for that, so I respect all of you. Thanks. Just want thank to tell you. you that. And I will have that meeting. Yes, right. <laughs> we will. I will. I appreciate that. I appreciate the work of the Salvation Army. And I tell you what, the fact that that family shelter is open year round is really, really important to this community. And it's wonderful that we've had the funding and it was through the COVID funding that we've been able to have it open, but we need to support it being open all year round, all the time, because the need is great for families. So that's definitely an important issue besides affordable housing. Is there anyone else that had intended to speak tonight that did not get signed up? Seeing no one. Um, the next item on the agenda, or agenda is mayor and council comments. And I just wanted to bring up a subject uh, because of the 4th of July weekend. And we had an amazing amount of fireworks going on in our community. And um, it, you know what? It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to celebrate our country and Independence Day. One of the challenges that sometimes I face are when citizens Facebook us and comment on the fact that we're not enforcing our laws and um, or our local ordinance on not shooting off aerial fireworks. And so I ask uh, both for the police an update, uh, which Eric Skoglund was helped me get, but I also was thinking about um, what do we do as we look to the future? And it's not that I'm opposed, it's just that when you don't enforce what's on your books, what do you do with that? Because people look to us because it is an ordinance and they look to us to enforce our local ordinances. So one of the things that we did and this council all agreed to do uh, two years ago was actually go to the legislature and ask them to define what an illegal firework is. And um, Kirk, you can come up and speak to this rather than me, and we'll try to be brief, but I think this is an opportunity that um, I really would like to ask us to um, decide do we want to do this again and go back, because really I think it's part of the issue. So Kirk, I'll let you, yeah. you and I spoke, and I'll let you go off. You yeah. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, the Mayor and I did speak earlier today, and, and uh, across the state for the first time that I'm aware of, we, had, we did have fire departments that banned the use of fireworks in their in their districts up in Lewiston, um, which it was happening across the river in Washington, and so everyone that was going to be lighting in Washington that no longer could was planning on coming to Lewiston to light their uh, illegal fireworks, and so the Lewiston fire chief made the decision to ban all all fireworks in that city. Wow. And so I'm sure as we read those stories in the news, uh, we see reactions, um, some out of fear and some out of uh, you know our 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 own beliefs. Um, we did two years ago as a group, both as a fire department and as council and mayor, uh, try to get more definition to the state law as to what is illegal and why they're being allowed to be sold in Idaho. Uh, we do know that, the, that a person buying illegal fireworks does sign a waiver stating they will not light those fireworks in the state of Idaho and that they could be held accountable for those damages. So um, that, that was uh, received by the legislator uh, committee that was sent but was never read. Um, and, and we thought about trying again this year. Uh, however, there, there is really no traction in it. It's, it's something that's been tried over and over again by fire departments throughout the state for years. And until we get real good definition at the state level, um, whether it's for policing or from the fire side, there is no traction in holding someone accountable for purchasing them and then lighting them in the state. It becomes even more difficult when we see, see state leaders um, themselves using using these um, illegal fireworks and and, and saying that should, we should be celebrating our freedoms with these. So honestly, I, I would say that I'm now on Chief Joe Huff's side and that we need this to be taken at a state level, um, that it, will, it is very difficult for 
uh, proactive, safe community such as Nampa to enforce something that's not being enforced at the highest level within our state. So uh, a quick report from us, we did have a very busy weekend with the heat. Uh, we responded to over 110 calls in the 48 hours of our, of our holiday weekend. Uh, at multiple times had all, all of our apparatus out and at one point had two structure fires going at the same time. Uh, some of those still under investigation, but it was our, our crews did a very good job as well as I know that Eric is gonna give an update on what they saw. Uh, it was a busy, are. busy weekend in the, in the city of Nampa. Um, and I would also agree, it was pretty amazing the amount of fireworks that were going on. They are beautiful, but until we have a better rule in place at, at a higher level, um, we're going to continue to get community members that don't think we're enforcing, but it's really we're unable to enforce until it's better defined and, and held at a state level. Um, it would just be NAMPA, you know, pulling their residents out specifically and everybody else in the state being allowed to still use them. And that'd be a very difficult position to be. So, yeah, we just have to decide, are we going to continue at a state level to try and make a change um, across our our state. There's so many options that we could do, whether it's uh, make them legal and put and put rules on how they're to be used and the insurances that you must carry if you're going to buy them. Um, make them through permit. Make them take classes on how to use them properly and have the permit as they're using them. So when they are policed, they, they can show that they're allowed to use them. So it doesn't mean that they, we can't create a pathway for, to where they can still be used to celebrate our freedoms. It just needs to be done at a higher level than it, just this council because it would be difficult to enforce. So. Okay. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Mayor? Yes. May I ask Chief? Yes. Questions? And then we'll have Eric Skoglin come and just share any updates. Thank you. I do have a few questions, Chief. At the beginning, you said some of the fire departments banned, banned the uh, use of fireworks. What jurisdiction or authority do they have to do that? So they, did ha they do have authority within that fire district to ban uh, due to the current conditions, weather conditions, especially in Lewiston. Um, they were very fearful of the type of uh, emergency it would create if, if it was to go poorly. So they do under their, under the, would be the fire authorities right as the fire authority in that district. And for city of Lewiston, it was within the city. So the fire chief is that fire authority. For here, when we become a district, it would probably lie more under Patrick and Ron working together within our agreement because we won't have that that uh, uh, necessarily the ordinance authority, but as the as the agreed upon fire authority, he can make that call to ban. I'm sure it wasn't taken very, I mean, it probably wasn't liked very much uh, to make that call. Thank you. Uh, and you read my mind. I was going to kind of flesh that out as far as between the fire district and the city fire department. Uh, the next thing would be, when we two years ago decided to go to the state legislature and ask them to define um, what the what illegal fireworks were, et cetera, uh, is there someone like a fire marshal or state fire marshal that makes that determination as to whether they're going to be banned, whether they're going to, or was it just solely the legislature did not look at it? Yeah, they didn't look at it. We were really trying to follow Arizona, which has a really good uh, description of what is illegal. We were just trying to define these are the illegal types of fireworks uh, in the state of Idaho um, because it just says illegal fireworks in the in the code. And so we were trying to get them to define what is illegal. Uh, and so that was our first effort. Um, and I, I would have to ask Ron, is it under the fire marshal's purview for fireworks? I, I think it's under the state legislature that would define that law. And is that 110 calls? Is that higher than normal? Um, it's not the highest we've ever seen, but it is higher than normal, yes. Do you think so. some of that had to do with the celebration after 18 months of being locked up and celebrating our country because I, I of would, the status? Of I would repeat, mayors, I, I saw a lot more fireworks this year than I've seen in the past. So um, oh, those are all calls. So those are everything from emergency medical calls to fire calls, um, everything from grass to home fire. So just in that 36 hours from 8 o'clock Saturday morning until a little after midnight on Sunday, um, we saw 100, 110 calls, which we probably average about 30 some calls a day. So it was almost double what our normal call call volume is. So my final comment, and maybe this goes to the police department. Um, so I'm all about educating people instead mm -hmm. of doing something first. Let's educate them. So when those calls come in, or or the fires happen, or whatever, and you have disgruntled people that are saying, "We'll see if they didn't have the illegal fireworks." 
do does your um, do your firefighters and perhaps the police department do they reach out to these people and allow them to understand it is not something we can control right now within the city we have been trying to get the definition etc yeah and i think with each one of the phone calls we receive we, we have to explain that often that it, it is something that is unenforceable at the city level um, in the city within the city we've we've created a space where illegal fireworks cannot be sold um, those are being sold in the county and we can't control that. And if they're being brought into the city and, and, and used, that's against the waiver that that citizen signed. Um, so enforcement really then comes down to um, people uh, having the, the resources to do so. And, and all I can tell you from the fire department standpoint, we had to bring in extra people to run uh, extra apparatus. And those, at, at certain points, those were all being used at the same time. Meridian actually had to turn us, actually not turn us down, but request that we not use their assistance because they were also out of, of apparatus at the same time. So we had one available engine between Meridian and Nampa at, at certain points during the 4th of July celebration. And that's worrisome as, a, as an organization that protects the, the community. So um, yeah, next year we'll, we'll up our game even more and, and possibly put more, more apparatus. And we were trying to, obviously we're in a, a pretty critical state uh, as we tr transfer over, we're trying to, to be as fiscally responsible as, as we can be. So we looked at our call volume and identified a very specific time that we would need extra people, and we so we tailored it to that. Um, it worked very well, but we probably could have could have added more if we. Actually, we should have probably added more because we we ran out. So. Well, thank you for the information yeah. and your time. Appreciate you bet. It. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Mayor Council. Yeah. Um, so the police department, I'll just go through a few statistics. Um, we do modify our response um, because we do have a large volume of, of calls to us on fireworks each year. So going into this, um, we basically, uh, when we do get calls, uh, we will post that so officers can see where those calls are coming in from. Um, but we generally don't respond to calls unless it's reported as some dangerous type of usage. So it's being shot toward a house or shot at people or things like that um, with, with those types of fireworks. Um, we recognize, as the fire chief said, there are a lot of illegal fireworks, I guess as you would characterize them, uh, to, that, that do get sold and purchased and then discharged in the city. So uh, it's a challenge to try and enforce all of that activity. So that's, that's why our plan is the way it is. Um, and this just gives you a little bit of an idea of some of our calls for service. So we had 117 um, reports of fireworks calls uh, between July 3rd and July 5th, um, which is down a little bit from last year. Um, but our 911 calls during that same period of time were up. Um, we had 465 um, 911 calls compared to 352 last year, so up over 100 for 911 calls. And our general Overall calls for service during that same period were up uh, slightly at 1,346 during those three days. So, um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea. It was 1,320 last year, so roughly the same, but up just a little bit. Um, and, but I'll stand for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Council, I just wanted to just broach the subject at some point we'll come back maybe before our legislative session and I think it would be helpful if the state would just define what an illegal firework is and then we as a city um, it just helps with our communication and what our response to that is so I don't want to impede on anyone's fun although you do we do get contacted by citizens asking why we don't enforce so with that, unless there's further comment, we'll move on. Are there any other comments from, any comments from council? Mayor, just real quick, uh, I thank Patrick already. Not that these petitions are gone, thank you so very much. And uh, Councilwoman Levi, I, I was out of town, but thank you for all your work for the Garden Country Rally. I know it was mm -hmm. hot and challenging, but thank you and Dave Ferdinand and all the team. Mm -hmm. so appreciate you and hopefully even though the, the crowd are hurt, it's, <clears throat> Minimal because of the heat that will continue this on and on again. Very important. Thank you. Thank you, Darrell. Can I go? Yes. 
Yes, over the, <clears throat> over the last month, or no, I say over the last year, this council has had to take care of many obstacles in terms of apartment complexes. We've had the community uproar, and we've had a lot of them in favor of. And so I think the way that this council has has had their hands tied because of the uh, ordinances and because of the locations and the need for apartment complexes, it's important that, that I think that we set a good direction of where we want to go as a city in terms of apartment complexes. We turn some down, but then again, we approve others. So as a developer and a contractor, if I was in your boat and I would be wanting to build here in Nampa, not knowing what this council was going to do or not knowing the direction the council would take after they're investing all this money and time and effort, that it would be a, toy, a coin toss up in the air. And I think we deserve more than that as a community. Um, if we could... Just an idea, council and mayor, and to our community, if we could just think about where we're headed here. And one example would be, if we was to put in our ordinances or our zones, where apartment complexes would be easier, viable, and, and more cost effective to our developers and to our community. Because right now, we're we're at a, at a crisis with our homes, and crisis with our homes when their brand new homes are $450,000. No one can buy those. But unfortunately, that's, that's the way it is. So the opportunity is for apartment complexes to come forward and give the people a place to reside. There's not a one of us in here on this council that says that we don't believe that, that we need to have people here. We need to have services for them and a, and, and a place to live. We need that. But at what expense? At what expense do we portray ourselves as being community leaders and actually are hang-tied because of our ordinances and zones? We do need apartment complexes, but we need them in the different structured zones of where the people know where they could be. And we also know where the developers could have an idea. If it's an approved area in a zone, then there's no doubt what it would pass. If now we've had the community actually an uproar over a lot of the residential subdivisions, that's a tough call for us because those are in our community. We've been asking them for help. All these, all these last terms that I've been in, we asked them to be in, to forthright to us and, and to give us information. But then when we pass, and they don't, and they never agreed to it. What are we doing? What a message are we sending to our community? Their their voice matters to us. It matters to me. <clears throat> but it's economical for us to help each other. And so I want to just put that in your mind, Council and, and and Mayor. Maybe be thinking about changing things a little bit, maybe. But I want the community to know that we are trying. Our best foot effort is to give everyone a chance to live here in Nampa, but not make it where it intrudes on other homeowners. And at times it has to, yes, I know that. But I, I'm, I'm really concerned, and I want to make that perfectly clear that I support giving the people a place to live who can't afford it. And uh, I hope we can do something. Thank you, Mayor. Victor, thank you for your comments. Uh, as I look at Rodney, I think the thing that's running through my head is that we just recently did finish our uh, future land use map and our comprehensive plan, and we did redefine certain areas, and we're just in the process of changing a lot of our code regarding density and allowable uses, and so that will be coming before a public hearing soon, and uh, that will be out there. And if we have an error in an area, I think sometimes we have um, projects come in in an allowable use that we deny. And that is difficult because it is in our future land use map. It is an allowable use. The council denies it, which makes it difficult for the developers, but we deny it because we're listening to the residents. And so uh, those are very difficult things. Um, and so... Um, 
I think, I think both planning and zoning and city council has been part of the most recent code review and the changes that are coming forward. I'm not sure what the answer is um, <clears throat> with where we are today because we have just recently taken a look. Um, Rodney, you're welcome to, to respond with any comments and then we'll move forward, but thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I think that one thing we could do and, and what staff is planning on, I, I think we heard in our workshops a desire to look at that future land use map again. And um, we are planning in the fall to, to do exactly that. We hope to cover all the code changes and then we'll go back to city council and planning and zoning in a workshop of some kind and relook at our future land use map. We've already started to draw on a big map and say, what could we do here? Um, and, and it does come down to what you place on the, on the zoning map specifically, but you start with the future land use map. And so that's a good first start, I think, and we can have an open discussion at that time. And then, and then as uh, developers or property owners come in and they request a zone, um, there are some zones, for instance, the RML and the RMH zones, that actually do outright permit uh, an apartment to go into them. So if that's the direction that we place in the comprehensive plan and, the, and that zone comes in for uh, annexation and zoning or a rezone, then that is the way to ensure that, yes, they can build an apartment in that, in that location. So I think it's just gonna be an ongoing discussion, but specifically a workshop sometime in the fall. Mayor Jim. Yes. I appreciate this conversation. Um, I don't know how many typical residents, <clears throat> excuse me, would look at a land use map mm -hmm. and really understand it. So I almost wonder if another step would be to work with um, homeowners associations so that in yeah. the CCNRs they know what could come into that area when they purchase a home. Because you do have to sign that you read your CCNRs. Um, and so I wonder if you know we even work with them to make sure that you know that when you buy here, you could have multifamily apartments near you at some point. Because I, I do think we, we hear from the residents and it's hard. I mean, it, it's really hard, but it, it's also, it puts us in a tough situation when it is an allowable use. Mm -hmm. When you have people investing the money mm -hmm. and then we're, you know, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I wonder if there's another step we could take, Rodney, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I propose that uh Todd weigh in here on this. <laughs> um, Mayor and Council Member Machian and uh, Rodney. So um, I guess I always express a little caution in getting too far into the CCNR world as a city council. Um, technically, it's a private contract between the association and the property owners and the property owners themselves. I, you can perhaps require provisions in the CCNRs, but you don't want to be in the enforcement business of the CCNRs themselves. And then the associations typically also have the power um, in accordance with their covenants to amend them. So uh, you need to be aware of that provision. Um, so if you're, if you're going into that world, um, I guess you need to go into it with eyes open. And if it's a requirement that something be included, as long as you're not in the enforcement business, that would be my main advice there, and then otherwise go into it cautiously and thoughtfully. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor one last comment there. I, um, I, I do want to point out, though, that we have tried to work with those um, HOAs. Um, there's not neighborhood associations so much uh, in the city of Nampa as there are in the, in the city of Boise, for instance. They have funding that they dedicate to neighborhood associations or neighborhood, uh, they're a conglomeration of a bunch of subdivisions. But each subdivision has to, needs to register with the um, Secretary of State's office. And so we have a contact information for each subdivision, but a lot of times those are management companies, HOA management companies that cover multiple subdivisions. And it sometimes is very challenging to get the word out through that organization. Um, we do our best though, and when we did the future land use map, we do our best to contact them and involve them that way. 
but I, I will say that it, it's challenging to get them involved. Thanks, Riley, you're working with them. Yeah. Thank you, Rodney. Victor, thank you for bringing it up. It's a very good discussion. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Are there any other council comments this evening? Okay, see none. We will move to our first agency uh, report. And um, Jacob, I think is this you tonight that we have uh, the Nampa Fire Protection District Map Fund or Kirk? Is he? Yep. It's you. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Power that I'd handle, it and then he can fix anything that I broke. Along okay. the way. So, Council Mayor, thank you again. Um, so exciting things. Uh, we've we've done a lot of work, and and what we are accomplishing. Um, as a city and as a district takes focus and collaboration and commitment to our to our citizens and so first just a bit of good news before we share the rest of the good news is uh, I want to thank each of you for your for your trust in us um, releasing the impact fees uh, I wanted to let you know that there is a for the first time in 15 years there's a signed contract uh, that has been signed and enacted for station six construction and so as of last Tuesday afternoon, uh, the work has begun, and, and we hope to open the Station 6 in February of 2023. So that is pretty exciting for our community, and it was one of the main pieces um, as a council and as a commission that you promised, and we're, we're following through as quickly as possible. So uh, thank you for the trust. Thank you for letting us use those impact fees through the district, and we'll, we'll care for them uh, greatly and make sure they go as far as we can make them go. Um, as you're all aware, jointly the district and the, and the council work together on our major acquisition purchases fund. Uh, that money is for the replacement of worn out equipment stations. And over the years, we have diligently put money into that fund. And it has uh, now come to a point where it's no longer going to be a joint coordinated effort as the district will take ownership of all growth and future of the fire department. So we do we do have the money that both the city and district have put into there and it had plans. And so we proposed a, a, a budget for the committee to uh, consider. And really we have three priority items that we looked at. And uh, we did I did bring Chief Adams who is, who is running all three of these priority uh, efforts if you have any questions. But those efforts were, for us was the remodel of station one, uh, the repair of the front ramp in front of station one, and then the replacement of the last apparatus that we own, which is our large ladder truck or platform at Station 1. And it's the only one remaining that's over 10 years old. Uh, it happens that there isn't quite enough money in the MAP fund to do all three of those projects. However, uh, commissioners being well aware, they knew that if the, if the MAP fund committee uh, would approve the, the funding of the Station 1 remodel and the front ramp, the remaining funds left in the MAP, in the MAP fund today would go towards the purchase of the platform and all remaining funds would be covered uh, through the district's budget. So that was the proposal. Uh, the breakdown basically is currently we have just under $1.9 million. Um, station one is uh, just a little under 900,000 for, for a total remodel of the upstairs as well as the infrastructure of the building. Uh, we were very pleased to get the report back that the bones of the building will serve us far, far into the future. And it is the best place for our, our main station as we continue to seek if there's better ways to do things. There's, there's no doubt, and not only for us, but as you can see now, Canyon County also sees the value in its location, uh, very central to, to serve our community. So the bones are good. We do need to update the pipes and the electrical. So that's going to happen. And then there will be all new uh, living quarters upstairs that include kitchen, proper uh, bathroom facilities for, for, um, for everyone. The laundry room will no longer be in the male bathroom where people have to go in and do their laundry. We'll have an actual laundry facility, um, and we'll, we'll bring that up to, uh, to current. Um, the second piece is the ramp out front. Uh, we've been working with engineers to provide not only just a new ramp, but our storm water, uh, take care of our storm water. Currently, it goes into the gutter and into our city's system. We're, we're going to be put using a, uh, um, shoot, just lost the name, pervious papers. So ours, ours will be taken care of through the ground and no longer a uh, part of the stormwater uh, worry, which is pretty exciting. Uh, a lot of research done by Chief Adams and the engineers on, on that. Um, and it's, it's going to be one of the first of its, its first of its kind in Nampa. And there are other uh, examples, but we'll be, we'll be an example of hopefully what the future is when handling stormwater. And then the last is the aerial apparatus. It, it came in at $1.3 million for the, uh, for the quick quote. 
Um, we have about eight hundred of of thousand dollars remaining of the of the map fund, and we thought that with those being the three top priorities currently in our in our department, that those would be the three we requested. And uh, the committee listened, had great questions for us, uh, and then in the end approved those those uh, projects. So, anything else you can think of, Councilman? And this will be the last map fund. Yeah. Until the end of it. Right. It'll be just actually the map fund will be no more because mm -hmm. it is a joint fund between the district and the city. And with a move, it'll just, I don't know if that gets resolved by uh, ordinance or. So but, it is in the annexation agreement. I just wanted to give this report to council to know that the money went exactly where you, you intended it intended to go. It. The money went for the community of Nampa to see. Uh, long-term commitments to our downtown station and the downtown response units that were uh, the oldest ones left. So um, I appreciate uh, Councilman Bauer's commitment to the committee. It is the last time we meet him. He got lucky this time. I just happened to have a crew and his son's birthday was right there. So we took advantage and, and gave his son a ride. So it was a pretty fun day. Um, but it is the last time we'll meet. Um, we will communicate with Councilman uh, throughout the process. Anything that's not done as of January 1, um, the map funds, uh, uh, the, it, remember, everything is at that point at the district's um, responsibility. So we won't have a new ladder truck by that January 1 date. We just want you to know that that's where that money is going. The, the remodel and station one might not be fully completed, but that's where that money is, is going. And we'll keep Councilman Bauer updated and, and hopefully reporting back to you with those the, the progress of those Thank projects. You. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Carpenter, thank you, Councilman Bauer, for your service. It's appreciated. Are there any questions from the council? Mayor, I just I just need a little you know, a clarification. So the eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is, is not in the balance of the map fund, it is. Oh, it is. Okay. All all of those the projects Nampa we were in the Nampa Fire Protection District will be contributing an additional eight hundred fifty thousand dollars this year because the map fund balance of April twenty one is one million seventeen. Not yeah, and we, the city and district both still have one contribution to make during this budget year, um, and that brings us up to just under. So this nine. amount is available in this budget year. Is what you're saying? <laughs> yes. and, and I'm just curious, what's the, what's the percentage of district money? Do you know it's, what that contribution of the eight hundred fifty thousand? What percentage is city? And so up district? to this point, the the total the total uh, amount in the in the fund is fifty 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 percent city fifty percent. So four hundred twenty five thousand. Yeah, um, and then obviously the district will cover any remaining funds on the on the platform apparatus, which it looks to be between three and four hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions, Randy? <clears throat> Good job. I excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not going to get in the weeds on on a lot of the remodel stuff. I I had a lot of questions pop up, but mm -hmm. it's not my place to ask them at this point. If, direction you're going you feel comfortable with and the costs associated with it are, are what you feel comfortable uh, with paying then you know I'm not going to say anything along those lines I just hope that uh, you get a lot of the things accomplished that need to be accomplished in station one uh, the only question I had as far as the truck um, will it be relocated to station six or will it be taken out of service the when we do the construction no, as far as oh the the old the old, the old platform truck. so it goes into reserve and as a reserve unit, we can we will easily get another 10, 10 to twelve years use out of it. Right. Um, so it will be the backup to the new platform. So will it go to station six? Then? That's a good question. We we only have one other station that will fit in. So um, that is something that we have to look at. Luckily, uh, we are designing station six currently, and that is one of the thoughts we we do need somewhere to put it. Um, because it fits in station one and station five, and station five is currently full with other apparatus. So, um, you know, the conversation earlier um, about station six with the potential of relocating that ladder truck. That's what it's like. It would be a, a proper place to put it as a backup platform for sure. And then the wisdom of using permeable pavers, they'd have to be traffic rated. It's going to be, it's going to take a lot of abuse there. So, mm -hmm. um, just want to make sure you're making the right decision. Yeah, we're utilizing those over just standard concrete. Yeah, uh, I know uh, Chief Adams has done all the research on it, and we've been working with uh, an engineering firm on making sure we have the right the right uh, style and quality of paver out front. I mean, they, they obviously we have probably one of the heaviest apparatus in the city. So, yeah, 
three to five years from now, I'd hate to have you have issues with pounding uh, as far as on the soil subsurface yeah. material. So, uh, but other than that, no, I think the numbers are appropriate with the amount of work that's going to be done on that second level and uh, the vertical nature of, of exiting uh, the paths that are restricted to this point, or at least mm -hmm. not easily identifiable. I think we'll be able to take care of those things. Yeah. Thank you. And I've, I'm, I've toured that that station, so it's it's in need. I've been through it myself as a female worker, a thatcher, whatever. So it's just it needs to be with the times and be a little bit better liability. Also. Yeah, a lot of the work you see in Station One was um, uh, done by the crews themselves. I mean, if you look at the ca everything from the carpentry to hopefully not the plumbing, but probably plumbing at some points. If you look back in our history. Um, and the type of people that worked for the fire department. I mean, we had electricians, we had plumbers within the fire department. And not that I'm saying it was okay to do, oftentimes projects were taken under the radar and done. So it will be nice to finally have uh, a facility that we can put into a life cycle and manage properly instead of uh, reacting to emergencies over the years, right? Yeah, and just follow up, you'll be I'm requiring. I'm sorry. Speak right into your microphone, thank you. Not sorry about that. Enough. Uh, I assume you'll be bonding and insuring the general contractor to yes. make sure that that's a part of the project. And actually, even if it does go into um, the time frame in which we'll be operating under the districts, we have already have a contract to hire the city's uh, team to assist us through through the process as well. So, Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Jeff, I'm going to have, I apologize, but I have you do your staff report after public hearing. Council, I'd like to get through items one through four before public hearing because we have people sitting here that I don't want to have to have to sit here through the entire public hearing process. So we're going to move into new business action item five one. This is to authorize the mayor. We have two different uh, resolutions here tonight, one for Hubert Osborne, the other for Jeff Cornelius. They're different. Um, situations and Rick I would like for you to come up and um, give us a little bit of overview about the process so this is to authorize the appointment um, the first one of Hubert Osborne to the development impact fee advisory committee to fill a new seat as a as a citizen member for an 18-month term Rick thank you for yeah. quickly giving us an overview of the process Good. I'll, I will try to be brief um, when there's a board and commission um, the term that's going to expire our policy is to post um, Amy does a press release and we post on the website that we are taking applications we try to do that for a month and then once the application deadline closes we interview the applicants and uh, there's an interview committee that makes a recommendation to the mayor uh, with a letter stating the preference um, in this case there were three applicants um, for the posted position for the impact fee advisory committee um, one of the applicants was was non-responsive unable to schedule a time to do an, a follow-up interview she had also stated she didn't know much about impact fees she was just looking to get involved so it really um, then went to two applicants, Jeff Cornelius and uh, Hubert Osborne were, were two who applied. And the interview committee consisted of uh, Councilman Haverfield, um, uh, Tom Points, because of the public works uh, heavy involvement with impact fees, uh, Patrick Sullivan, who's the staff liaison for impact fee advisory committee, and then a member from the impact fee uh, advisory committee, Sharon Harris, who's here present. So um, we went through the interview process, and um, I help facilitate, just make sure it, it happens. I don't drive an outcome. I just make sure that the process uh, goes as well. And, and after interviewing both gentlemen, Jeff Cornelius and Hubert Osborne, it was the unanimous opinion of the four that both would be an asset on the, on the committee. So the recommendation to the mayor in the letter that's in your packet should reflect that the consensus with it is that both be recommended to serve. There is no, um, well, I think maybe our local ordinance, and Todd can speak to this, our local ordinance um, allows five to seven members. I think the state requires a minimum of five, and we set sort of a cap of seven. Right now, there's four members on the Impact Fee Advisory Committee. Uh, Ron Van Ocker and Chip Kinsler represent the development community. That is their full-time job and what they're engaged in. They represent uh, that. Dennis Davis and Sharon Harris. Uh, represent the citizens at large. And then if you recall earlier this year, um, 
Uh, Derek Cooper was recommended to fill in the, the development piece and, and uh, was not voted in. And so that's a remaining, uh, that's been a vacant piece. But with the local changes, um, we, we make sure that citizens at large have a majority. In, in the past, Derek would have been a third developer. It would have been a 3-2 developer to citizens at large on the five-member group. But with the changes that you've approved over the last couple of months, uh, the recommendation is to put Hubert Osborne and Jeff Cornelius both as citizens at large, which would move the group to five with Chip Kinsler and Ron Van Ocker, um, the remaining developers, um, uh, development um, community represented on the board. And so um, I think that's, that's a brief kind of fill in on the process that led to tonight's letter that Patrick drafted. Um, since he is the staff liaison and it recommends that both be so received. If I may. So, Mr. Davis is not serving anymore? Mr. Davis is serving. So there's a total of six in my mail. Yes, these two would bring it up to six. Uh, so right now there's four with a vacancy. So okay, I thought but, you mentioned five. So Yeah, five. so the vacancy would have been a five, mm. but we recommended that both Jeff and, and Hubert be um, recommended that they would both be an asset. So, um, yeah, Ron Van Ocker, Chip Kinsler, Dennis Davis, and Sharon Harris with the vacancy and then... Um, yeah, this would be a six, so. Are there any other questions before we move forward? Um, Mayor? Yes. So this puts me in a little bit of an awkward situation. I appreciate citizens when they want to come forward and be involved, but we made it pretty clear at our, um, when we talked about how we wanted the um, impact advisory fee committee made up, that it was not, that it was less developers than citizens at large. And while Mr. Cornelius has established himself as a financial advisor, he still holds a real estate license. And whether he's active or not, it still says that he's a real estate agent. And so that puts more on, as, on the developer side, even though he applied as a citizen. And that's, even though it was um, unanimous from the committee and the agenda says mayor approved, it still goes against what the will of the council was. So could we, just for clarity, it would, um, and Rick and I had this discussion earlier, the difficult thing with Jeff is that he wouldn't qualify as a realtor. In as, as far as the guidelines, he would be unable to serve at all because he's not, if he were appointed to represent the development community, he wouldn't qualify to represent the development community, hence why he has applied as a citizen. and. Rick and I just had this discussion a little earlier, and it was a good reminder that he would not qualify to serve in that capacity because he would not, he's not in that development community side. So, uh, which puts it in a little bit of an awkward place because his primary uh, business is not real estate. Why would, why would he not qualify for the developer side? That would be an interesting thing to know. Rick, I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, or I, I don't know if, if Patrick... Um, if, if I'm punting the ball on this, but I know that the information and discussing with Pat Patrick was that the the statute with the active and the the development community, because it's a the state statute, if I recall, it's it's called the Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee. It's actually and so um, the minimum requirements that the state um, puts within the statute envisions that the people who constitute the committee that are active in the, in the development community are people who are actually paying impact fees uh, regularly and therefore providing input on impact fees because it's an impact fee advisory committee. So um, someone who holds a real estate license and sells maybe uh, a few homes over a decade would not be someone envisioned in the state statute who's regularly paying impact fees um, from the development community. So. Um, so I, and, and Councilwoman Levi and Mayor, um, when, when the process, uh, took, took place, when the interviews took place, uh, Mr. Cornelius did disclose he does have a, um, a realtor's license and I think he's present here and, um, I think he may have noted that he's sold maybe a few homes over the entire, that, but that isn't what he does. Uh, he's a financial advisor and uh, he holds that license for, particular opportunities to do it, but it isn't what his active uh, profession is. He disclosed that. We, we still did the interview at that time. It wasn't um, like we, we conducted the interview and the, the group of the people um, were 
were asked if they had a preference. And, and to be candid, there was actually, um, there was, there was a d division among the group about who, if they had to pick one, uh, there was division. So th their preference was, why not both? We like them both. And so since that was what the recommendation came, the letter just reflects that. The committee's recommendation is that both, both be placed. So I, I just want to state that there wasn't, um, um, there was no disrespect intended, at least in the committee's recommendations from what the guidance of council was um, trying to figure out is he, a, is he a developer who pays impact fees and would represent that as far as a definition, or is he a citizen at large wanting to serve as a citizen, um, expressing concern that impact fees are fair um, for the citizen? He certainly in the interview conveyed uh, concerns as a citizen that impact fees um, be fair and protect the existing resident, which the intention is that growth funds growth. So. I appreciate the explanation, yeah. and I, I do believe he would do a good job. I also appreciate knowing that it's actually called the Development Impact Fee Advisory. I've never heard that, and I've never heard what the definition of a developer was, and so that's very uh, informative. Thank you. I, well, I can, I, and I would defer to, hopefully, I, I didn't overstate um, the issues. I, I would look to maybe legal uh, on this if, if you have the... I don't know if you have the Idaho code just in front of you, but I think it's section 6782, but I think the subheading in the state statute is, I think it says develop, development impact fee committee. Um, Madam Mayor and uh, Rick and Council Member Levi, that's correct. The title is Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee. Um, and it, it does, as Rick said, uh, the development community is defined as uh, those that are active in the business of so it, it creates a, an opportunity, I guess, for you to define what active means. Can you hear me, Mayor? Sorry. Uh, pull it, lift your uh, mic up. It's, these mics are directional, and so you have to speak directly into it. Okay. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the title of the statute is the Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee. Um, it does also talk about those from the development community being active in the business of development construction or real estate. And so it, it creates that opportunity for you to interpret and define what the word active means. Um, in an absolute perfect pure scenario, there would be no, you know, Jeff wouldn't have a real estate license, but um, he does and it's de minimis in this case and it's I think up to you to decide what your, um, your interpretation application of that language is uh, for this committee, which also would remind you is an advisory committee and doesn't have any authority to make particular decisions. So um, I, that's what I have to say. I'm happy to answer other questions if you have them. Mayor Clarence. Thank you. Yes. Am I, am I good to sit unless you have any more questions? For you? Okay, thanks. I, I'm willing to make a motion to uh, authorize the appointment of Hubert Osborne, who is the first uh, person up. It's not Jeff, so i make the motion to, because uh, we see Hubert as a, as a concerned citizen, uh, value to the community. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to appoint Hubert Osborne to the Development Impact Fee Advisory Committee to fill a new seat as a citizen member for an 18-month term, effective 7-6, ending in 1-6 of 23. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Bruner? By all means, yes. Do I? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Machi? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Osborne, for your diligence. Um, all you do for the community. Appreciate it. The mayor, I'll make the recommendation that we also accept Jeff Cornelius as far as on this uh, development impact committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Machi? Yes. Levi? No. Bauer? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Bruner? Yes. And Jeff, thank you. Yes. Thanks, Jeff, as well. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Hubert, likewise. Thank you both. And Sharon, thank you for your endless service. You serve in so many capacities, and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, it is after 6.30, but I would like to get through 5.3 on the agenda so that Courtney can go home. 
So uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to, this is authorizing the Nampa Recreation Center uh, mm -hmm. to propose a no contract monthly membership fee and membership policies as presented in your packet. Do we need a presentation? So moved. No, second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there Good. any discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Bruner? Yes. Levi? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Mucci? Yes. Good job. Great idea. Yeah. We like it. We love it. Thank you. I would like to ask, uh, Beth, you could actually, I don't think you have to stay for any other reason. So if you could come forward, let's do 5-4 on the agenda. And um, as Beth comes forward, this is her last council meeting. And I realize that we're preparing for your going away on Thursday, but I didn't do anything for tonight. And um, the council, you are all invited. Her going away is Thursday afternoon. I believe it's from 3 to 4.30. Is that correct? Over at the Development Services Center. As Beth steps in to serve in her new ca capacity at BVAP, she's going to do an amazing job. And I just want to say how much I have appreciated your work, Beth. You've done a great job. And as we've said, your fingerprint is in our community and on our community in a number of places. And you've, you've served us very, very well. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. And so it's, it's a great thing for you and your career and for our community. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I don't like public recognition, so it was fine not to say anything. <laughs> um, but well, before you tonight, I'm excited that this is, I get to have this on the agenda before I leave. So Project Custom is a project we've been working with since the beginning of the year. They're a large um, manufacturer. They're not ready to make a lot of public information known yet because they're still in their final due diligence on their site selection process. So they are still evaluating. Um, they have some sites in Nampa that are their finalists, um, but they do have some other opportunities as well. That they want to make sure they have everything lined out before they make their final decision, but I think we're really close. They would construct a 550,000 square foot facility and employ over 200 people, um, paying above the county average wage. They'd be close to $45,000 a year for the wages that they would pay. And um, they are looking at some sites that would have some significant infrastructure costs associated with it. As part of their incentive analysis with the State Department of Commerce, uh, Commerce put forward an opportunity for up to $300,000 from the Idaho Opportunity Fund. Um, but the way that that program works is it flows through the city. So there's no obligation from the city for any of this funding, but the city has to be the applicant for it through the Department of Commerce. Then um, we would submit documentation of the infrastructure costs associated with it. Um, the state would pay us, and then we would pay the, um, the company. So it, we've done this with um, both Lactalis uh, early, I guess probably around 2007, and then also with GoGo -Go Squeeze in 2014 when they came in. There are specific milestones that they'll have to reach, so they have to uh, demonstrate that they've met their employment goals and the wage rates. So like with GoGo -Go Squeeze, I actually received a copy of their payroll report, so and then had to go through and analyze it and make sure that they met the appropriate milestones. So. Um, my request before you today is that I'm able to submit this application on behalf of the city for Project Custom, and I will do that before Friday. I'll make a motion to authorize that. Second. And then I'll ask a question. Will, uh, will this information be presented to the Nampa Development Corporation as well? Uh, will you be phoning in, or will, will there somebody else be... Uh, this information. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be quite ready for a formal action with the NBC this month, but yes, they will come before the board at some point. They, and they, they themselves or, or somebody representing? We'll have representation. Okay. So, Thanks, yeah. Beth. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Levi, yes. Thank you. Question, Beth. So as I'm reading through this document, it says to provide an incentive for business. And I'm just logically wondering with the growth that we're experiencing and people want to be in Nampa, and even though it's not costing us, but why would we be offering incentives at this time? For the city of Nampa, this project in particular is a, it's kind of the first domino for um, the area that they are evaluating is within our industrial area that is currently lacking. It's, it's an agricultural field, which is fabulous. We need them, but that's where we have our future industrial growth. So this is that first pivotal one. Um, that could come in and really launch that entire area for future industrial projects. So, um, and it's certainly of a significant size. It's over a $100 million investment. 
and we don't see that size of projects very often. And just to follow up, I am supportive of industry because that's good growth, but just found that curious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Your turn. Yes. Beth, are you saying that this could be sort of like the first domino in like Caldwell, the way that their industrial park yes. develops? Absolutely. Okay, we've had a motion and a second on the table. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Bruner? Yes. Machi? Yes. <clears throat> Levi? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Thank you very much, and thanks for letting me go home early. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we are ready to move into public hearings, and um, thank you for your patience. Our first public hearing... Um, is actually, uh, I need a motion to go ahead and continue this public hearing again until uh, July 19th. So moved. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Bruner? Yes. Machi? Yes. Levi? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Item 6-2 is an action item. This is an annexation and zoning to uh, residential professional. Uh, zoning District for Maple Leaf at 0 and 4921 and 509 Stand Lane. There are county, county parcel numbers that I won't go through. This is for um, the Orcha Lara. I'm saying it probably wrong and I do apologize. Heights subdivision and a development. This is also a development agreement for future subdivision to 30 single family detached residential. 24 single-family attached residential townhomes, one commercial, and three common lots. The gross density of 7.62 and a net density of 9.18. So uh, this is for Landmark Pacific Development, representing William and Linda Larson. Is the applicant with us this evening? Thank you. Thank you for stating your name and address. Good evening. Uh, Stephanie Hopkins with Came Engineering. I'm here representing Landmark Development. Um, my address is 5725 North Discovery Way, Boise 83713. And I think I can drive, can I, on this? Okay. So this project probably looks familiar to you folks because you saw it in January of this year. Um, we, are, we were initially heard by PNZ in December of 2020, and um, they recommended approval at that time came before you were not as favorably received with our plan at the time. And so we've kind of gone back uh, to the drawing board and have reconceptualized some of our plan. So, uh, excuse me, um, we're requesting annexation into city limits with the RP district with a concept plan. Sorry, I'm like short of breath. <laughs> um, with a concept plan that we'd like to attach to the single family um, community that we're proposing. So. This is for Maple Leaf. I'm excited to talk to you about some of the changes we've made too. Um, the property is approximately 7.81 acres. It's located south of Stam Lane and is approximately 800 feet to the east of Happy Valley Road. As you can see here, it's um, not incorporated into, camp into Nampa yet. Let's see if I can point. Oh, okay. Um, so our property is located just to the east of some of those that are unincorporated. Christy, yeah. could you put your cursor on it for her so that when she is kind of wanting to point that we could see exactly where she's looking? So can you see the cursor? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so Thank this you. is the property. And uh, we're, let's see, so 7.81 acres. We're located south of Stam Lane and east of Happy Valley Road, as I said currently unincorporated in Cannon County as our neighbors are as well. And we're contiguous to the, pro or to the city of Nampa, which is located to the north. Um, this, the property to the north is the Gateway Center. It's currently zoned BC, which is community business. It allows for a wide variety of uses. Um, currently there's retail, there's a WinCo, there's some exercise facilities, other service facilities that are located within that zone. Um, it's about 70 acres. And as I'm sure you're all aware, was recently acquired by Gardner Company, who has a reputation for doing a lot of mixed-use development and doing some really high-end um, multifamily 
as well as commercial and mixed use development. So to the south, we do have Canaan County property um, and directly to the east and west is property in Canaan County that's single family residential. Uh, to the west, we do have the RMH zone, which is the multifamily zone. There's the, um, the gateway apartments over there, as well as the, um, let's see. So the station and gateway apartments are located to the west, as well as a, a new development that was approved in 2020. It's about 480 feet to our west. Oh, I actually created an exhibit so you can see where our proposed area is. And then um, this is the multifamily development that was approved in 2020. They do have approximately four fiveplexes, four sixplexes, which is about 44 units on three and a half acres, um, which is about 12 and a half dwelling units an acre. And then there's a skilled nursing facility that was approved in 2016 to the south of that. And then there's some, some suburban residential to the west and then the healthcare um, zoning district to the north that's uh, comprising the St. Al's kind of campus. So the purpose of this slide is really to kind of situate not only us but you in understanding what the overall region is developed in. There's a bunch of um, employment, commercial, and uh, mixed opportunities for folks to live and work near um, the interstate and other transit corridors. So, again, this is just another exhibit to kind of um, situate you. So there's Walmart located north of I-84. There's um, multiple recreational opportunities, a huge employment center at the medical campus kind of area, and then um, some industrial uses in the area as well. So the future land use map does designate this piece of land as community mixed use. Um, there are all of our adjacent properties are also designated as community mixed use. The comp plan and the future land use map were updated, I think, in February of last year. So this should be pretty reflective of what the community wants for growth in the area as this area does redevelop. Um, there's some low density residential that's located to the northeast and high density to the, to the west, which as we're seeing, is kind of already starting to redevelop into that high-density residential. Um, Happy Valley Road is an arterial roadway, and Stam Lane is a collector roadway, both of which are meant to capture a fair amount of traffic, especially as things redevelop and more traffic is able to travel on improved roadways. So community mixed-use land use does, does uh, correlate with the RP zoning district we're requesting. It's, um, it does encourage eight-plus units an acre, we're a little bit below that because we have taken into consideration your comments from the last time around, as well as um, neighbors' comments, and have tried to decrease our density, as well as make things a little bit more consistent with our adjacent neighbors. So we're at 7.62 uh, gross dwelling units an acre. Um, let's see. So as Compass states in the, uh, in the staff report, the location is an infill site in an employment-centric area. It's close to thousands of jobs within a mile of the site, and that really is where you want um, homes to be located as well, so that folks can walk to work or walk to recreation or, or food or whatever they need to as, um, and not use the roadways as much. So this is our conceptual development plan, um, which would be tied to the development agreement should you favorably um, approve us tonight. Uh, we are proposing 58 lots overall. 54 of those are single family residential lots, 30 of which are single family detached lots on the periphery of the site. So just to orient you, north is actually facing to the left and all the homes, all the lots that you see on the bottom and the right and the top are actually 6,000 square foot single family detached lots. I'll show you the difference between the last time we came up here too from the plan that you saw the last time around. but. Um, this is much less dense than it was previously. Um, and then we're showing 24 single family townhome lots on the center, in the center of the site, as well as an open space lot and a common or a commercial lot on the far left or the north part of the site. The commercial lot is about 30,000 square feet and the open space lot is about 28,000 square feet. So as I mentioned, our proposed density is 7.62 dwelling units a gross acre, and 9.18 units a net acre. 
and um, we're proposing two points of access. So it's not easy to see on easier to see on this slide, but um, one both from Sam Lane into Acer Loop, which will be a private street throughout the subdivision. So since the last time we met with you, we did speak with staff a few times. Um, we read through the findings to understand kind of exactly where you all were coming from and the changes you'd like to see, some of your concerns at the time, and met with neighbors as well to discuss what they would like to see. This is our original layout. As you can see, we did show townhomes on the periphery as well as the interior of the site. Um, we initially had shown uh, 94 lots and now we're showing 54 lots altogether. So we have 30 single family residential lots on the periphery, whereas before, I think it was about 60. Um, and in the center, we've got 24 uh, townhome units. So the periphery of the site is actually all single family detached. The, everything in this subdivision will be single family homes all to be owned in, in fee simple homes. But the center of the site will be townhomes, so they'll be attached single family homes and the exterior of the site will be detached single family homes. So just to give you a little bit of a, a summary, we decreased the residential lot count from 94 to 54. We decreased the density from 12 units an acre to 7.62 units an acre. We replaced 54 townhome lots on the periphery of the site with 30 approximately 6,000 square foot detached single family lots. And we decreased the 36 townhomes in the center of the site to 24 townhomes. We increased the rear setback on all homes. So the, if you'll remember from our last discussion, there was a little bit of talk about the, the rear setbacks. We'd originally shown eight feet. We've increased that to 15 feet and we've increased the open space at the south part of the project to include a children's play structure and a gazebo and seating area for residents. So just to give you one more look at how that's changed, it's um, really opened up the site plan and our goal was really to make the lots on the periphery more consistent with the lots that are on um, our adjacent Canyon County neighbors. Um, we realize this area is going to redevelop and it'll all change in the future, but we wanted to try to make it a little bit more of a transition in the interim. So this is a rendering of the site just to give you a little bit of an idea of how common space will be situated. Um, obviously we'll landscape it in accord with the city's requirements. Um, we're also going to be locating the gazebo and a tot lot at the south part of the site, as I mentioned. Um, the north side will have a future commercial lot that'll be likely a, a neighborhood serving kind of use. It could be a small coffee shop or an office, something that would really fit in with the area, but would be walkable for residents. And hopefully a service would actually allow them to, to walk to it to something they might want to do. These are just some typical home elevations that we're proposing. Have some nice finishes with soffits and um, batten and board finishes, kind of modern. And then the home finishes on the interior too are quite nice and customizable for residents. So um, in reading the staff report for both this time around and the first time, um, there were several, several neighbor concerns that we kind of noticed and um, one of which was a concern that we were not meeting the Orcalara Heights CCNRs. And so this was originally a parcel within that overall subdivision. But um, in looking at, we talked to our title company and found that our, there are no CCNRs attached to this piece of ground. Um, and then also had our survey team look at it to make sure that the legal description that was associated with the CCNRs is not associated to our property. So it looks like the CCNRs that were referenced in some of the public testimony are actually for property that's to the to the east. So the ones that we've highlighted in blue are where those CCNRs are, are associated to. So just to kind of clear that up a little bit, wanted to make sure that we were also in, you know, we were abiding by what rules were applicable. Um, there was a mention of vagueness. You're, I'm sorry, and I didn't mention that 10 minutes this oh, I'm morning. Sorry. So and you're doing a great job. I'm just, yeah. uh, but it's all in our packet. And I okay. guess I'm, I'm one that kind of likes to hurry things yeah, along I'm, as, I'm long as, as long as it's in the I don't packet. have a clock up here, so I kind of uh, tend to ramble. May, Mayor, may I ask one question? Yes. Okay, so Ms. Hopkins, right? Yes. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. Uh, who, who's, your, who's your builder? Have you designated a builder or builders for these 30 freestanding homes? I don't 
I see you have a design, so somebody has uh, at least presented that to you. Madam Mayor, Mr. Berner, I don't know. Cambridge? Cambridge Homes. Cambridge. Is the have they built in Napa before? Or do you, yeah, they've the done, history? I think they've. Okay. In Heartland? Heartland. Okay. All right. Thank, Thanks. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay. How much more did you have in your presentation? I know it is in our packet, and thank you. I'm, I'm just, I was just I about done. I think you were there. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you, and I apologize for well, rambling if I did, but. You're um, doing a great job. I just, just I thought we were going to kind of stick to these 10 yeah. minutes for presentation. No, that's great. Okay. I usually, um, I appreciate you listening to us, and we appreciate the, the option to come back before you with a plan that we feel is improved. And that we've really worked on, you know, with neighbors and staff to make sure that it's complying with everything that you were concerned about the last time around. So, great, thank you. Thank you very much, Council. Do you have any questions at this time, Councilman Haverfield? Um, appreciate your presentation. You Thanks. listened to us. I, I think uh, from the prior development that was brought before us, obviously this is a tremendous improvement. My only question is the interior lots. Uh, you call them townhomes. Are they separated by property lines, or are they? Are they townhouses or are they townhomes with uh, common? Madam Mayor, uh, Councilman Haverfield, they will be separated by lot lines. So those lines that you see there are actually property lines and they'll be all separately owned. Okay. And they'll be two story? Yes. With garages or not? Yes. They'll have, um, it, I think the floor plan differs, but it's two car garages on most of them. And I think one car garage on a couple. So, and then the parking pad out front. So, regardless, we'll be meeting the city's requirements for parking. And then 15 foot uh, setback as far as on the east and west boundary, the south boundary to the other uh, Correct. property owners. So the connectivity as far as for, uh, for city property is to the north. Is that correct? There's nothing to the east or west at this point. Madam Mayor, or Councilman Haverfield, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thanks. And then one last clarifying question. My understanding is the exterior single family homes are one story. Not yes. two, is that yes, correct? Yes, Madam Mayor, that's correct. Thank you for bringing that up. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. We'll Thanks. have you back at the okay. end. You know the, the routine. Yeah, and Councilman, thank you, Christy, for coming forward. Councilman uh, Bruner, thank you for the reminder. I keep forgetting to mention the 10 minutes. And so, Debbie, I'm going to have you help me track time on the 10 minutes, and we will. I'll get into that routine. So thank you. I just want to get... Council them out for her out of here person. for her birthday. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Christy, thank you. No. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Christy Watkins, Principal Planner for the City of Nampa. Um, so, the request before you this evening is for approval or denial of the annexation and zoning to RP of the property located at zero and 4921 and 5009 Stam Lane with a development agreement to include the concept plan for the proposed Maple Leaf concept. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this project at the public hearing on May 11th. So the property is currently zoned, or sorry, outside the city limits and not, um, not yet zoned by the city, but it is contiguous on the north side uh, to the BC zone. It is bordered on the southeast and west sides by Canyon County residential properties and on the north by the Nampa Gateway Center. The uses in the area, as she stated, are currently single family residential with some retail and some uh, higher density apartments <coughs> to the west. So the property is eligible for annexation since it is adjacent to the Nampa city limits and it is the proposed zoning and development plan conforms to the guidelines that are set forth in the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan future land use designation is community mixed use, which as she stated, calls for a maximum development of 27.8 units per acre and this project is proposing 7.62 dwelling units per gross acre. The community mixed use district encourages development that is planned to specifically include commercial uses with a focus on providing community wide needs and services and high density residential. The RP zoning um, has standards that will be applied at the time of building permit and it will also be subject to design review on the building elevations. So this project, um, according to the staff analysis of this newly proposed project, it meets the comprehensive plan for the community mixed use designation. Um, Nampa, in its comprehensive plan, has determined that it is in the public interest to provide a mix of commercial services with varying residential housing opportunities. It is not within walking distance of any of the schools that it is um, going to be designated to, Columbia High School, 
East Valley Middle School and Endeavor Elementary School. Compass analysis states that the housing to job ratio indicates more housing is needed in this area. There is no current farmland being consumed by the development and there is 156 acres of farmland existing within a mile of this project. So she walked through the layout, um, 7.81 acres, 58 total lots, one commercial lot, three common lots, 30 single family lots, and 24 attached townhouse lots. And the open space provided comes to 0.65 acres for 9.17% of the property area. Um, the previous plan proposed 5.5%, so it has been increased. Um, so in the RP zone, just to kind of go over what the RP zone standards are for lot sizes, they shall meet or exceed 6,000 square feet for the first two units and 1,350 square feet for each additional unit for one structure um, on one lot that can then be split into individual lots that are attached. So for the sixplex structures in the center, they should be 11,400 square feet. This project shows them at 16,876 square feet. Um, the smallest detached single family lots should be a minimum of 6,000 square feet, and this shows them at 6,021 square feet. So the setbacks proposed are 20 feet from the back of the sidewalk. Um, the, the property line is in the center of the drive aisle, and so generally they are measured from the property line back. In this case, they have measured that 20 feet from the back of the sidewalk, 20 feet so that their driveways are 20 feet deep and out of the right of way. Um, they ha are required to have eight foot side and rear setbacks. They have proposed eight foot side setbacks and 15 foot rear setbacks on the perimeter properties. The de dedication of right of way on Stam Lane is required at 40 feet from the section line. A traffic impact study was reviewed and accepted by the city engineer and it was noted that no turn lanes would be required at the access point of this development. A detailed landscape plan will be required to be submitted with the preliminary plat. The correspondence that we received, we received from multiple neighbors as um, is shown in your staff report. We also received a letter of support from one neighbor that appreciates the efforts to address their concerns from the previous meetings. So um, the concerns that were expressed were decreased property value, increased traffic, increased noise, increased crime, um, destruction of that country feeling and the character of the neighborhood that would change drastically. We also received the standard comments from the building department, the fire department, the police department, and the engineering department. So the conditions of approval are listed in your staff report and we would make one note that the Planning and Zoning Commission had asked to reference an agreement regarding sewer extension to the south property on Orchard, um, but that's not going to be possible at this time. So per the, per the applicant's specific request and with NAMPA engineering support, uh, we would request that you remove condition 1E in your motion. With that, this is your motion for annexation and zoning to RP, and I will stand for any questions. Yes. Christy, uh, it appears that Acer Loop is what it's called, uh, two access points to the property. Uh, the western is pretty much in alignment with uh, Galleria Drive, which is coming out of the uh, theater area. Uh, the second entrance point is the distance. Are, are they appropriate? Has that been checked to make sure they're far enough apart? Uh, Councilman Haverfield, that would be an engineering question, okay. and I have not measured them. So the possibility of, of just this site layout is still possibly in question, or will there be somebody like Daniel that can come forward and speak? I think Daniel can probably speak to that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Daniel. I apologize, Mayor, Councilman Haverfield. I was speaking with Jeff. Uh, your question was? Okay, I was just looking at the site plan. Uh, the In this case, the lower drive that, uh, is in somewhat of an alignment with Galleria Drive is obviously a good thing, just the cross uh, potential there. But the second entrance point, is it far enough away that it meets our requ requirements? It does not meet our policy. However, as they looked at it for the turn lane warrant, 
we had them look at it from a safety perspective and we have said that it will work. So they're, they're, they're not going to be a restricted access in that second one? Not, not to start. That doesn't mean in the future it couldn't become right in, right out, um, but that's not something that is necessary at this point. So uh, Sam Lane, is it a fully improved um, road frontage, curb gutter and sidewalk? Mayor and Councilman Haverfield, the north side where the Gateway Center has been developed does have curb gutter and sidewalk. Mm -hmm. This property will be required to put in the sidewalk. They will not be required to um, do full pavement and curb gutter sidewalk widening or curb gutter widening per the city's current code. Why is that? Mayor, Councilman Haverfield, our, our current city code, as we amended it after we changed our impact fees, does not require collector and arterial roadways to be fully widened unless there is a warrant for turn lanes or something of that nature. Uh, the impact fees, when we raised those, that was the trade-off that we did with the, the development community because the, the reality is that widening in these short spurts does not do anything to gain us capacity throughout the system. And so we opted for that higher impact fee so that we could fund the intersection improvements. Um, and at some future point when the road widening is necessary, that would be paid for out of impact fees. So the interior road system, will they be a public road? Uh, they have proposed a private roadway. So it's private. Yes. So my only concern as uh, this moves forward is cross people crossing over Stam Lane, especially kids, uh, maybe a, even adults, people on bicycles wanting to go into that uh, entertainment area if it's retained as that. Uh, it's not really known, but I, my, my understanding is the theater might stay. Other aspects of that development might be uh, a mixed use, which would have an attraction to people. And being the near proximity, uh, is there would, would there be some point in the future where a hawk signal might be proposed uh, to be able to allow the cross access? Since otherwise, they have to go clear back down uh, to the light to be able to get across. And if we don't have any continuation of, uh, of a pathway, especially a sidewalk, uh, it's going to be kind of scary for those kids. So, Mayor Councilman Haverfield, the this property is located approximately 850 feet from the um, intersection. With that being the case, I don't think we would ever consider a hawk signal at that location. Um, the there is a project on the corner that it will be installing a sidewalk um, along their frontage, um, and that will reduce the gap um, between those two properties. Let me see here. To about 450 feet. Um, we can look at uh, what may be able to be done in between those, though there is not a dedicated right-of-way as those parcels in between are in the county. And so it's not very likely we would be able to have sidewalk installed along there. Um, it's more likely that uh, people who were trying to get across would need to go there and walk on the shoulder of the road till they got to the signal and then cross at that point. So is it an eight-foot sidewalk that would be required? Um, the, because it's a detached sidewalk, uh, five foot minimum is our current standard. Okay. And the sidewalk would not be right up against the road. Right. They can. So I have a question. Um, I know we had talked about if there's a, con even though the traffic impact study has not been done and maybe doesn't fully warrant a build out. One of the things that I think we had talked about, and Jeff, you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, I know that impact fees do fund the road improvements, but we have at times required some right in, right out adjustments at the time of the development in addition to the impact fees because of the impact. So Stam Lane is going to be a busy road. I think there's two concerns I would have is that we don't... Um, accommodate and plan for the traffic impact of this subdivision. And the other thing is the, uh, the not having a sidewalk and requiring them to go down. Can we not require that the action, the developer fund and put in the sidewalk to connect with the other sidewalk that is there? Because it shouldn't be done at the expense of the current property owners 
but there should be a safe way for people to access. Mayor, uh, the, the, we can look at whether we can accomplish that within the existing right-of-way. If not, um, I don't believe we would have any recourse to require the developer to go acquire property from a neighbor, um, or at least that would certainly not be something that has, has, has historically been the practice of the city to require the, a developer to go purchase right-of-way from a neighboring property in order to put um, something of that nature in. And when I'm not thinking, I'm thinking maybe a neighbor would allow them without a purchase to put a sidewalk in for the betterment of the entire area to where we have connectivity to a way to get across because there's definitely a safety issue. If you would not be putting in a hawk signal or something there, then it is, it's definitely a problem to safely get across that road. And Mayor, um, it, I'm sure that you can ask the developer whether if, if the property owners between those, there are, I believe, three property owners between them and the apartment project, you can certainly ask the developer if they would be willing to put in that sidewalk if those property owners are willing to work with them for that, uh, the ability to do such. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I, yes. I follow up on that. I was just thinking a local improvement district, if that's a potential here or not. Mayor Councilman Haverfield, because those properties are not within the city limits, that would not be an option. Are there any other questions for Daniel at this time? Thank you, Daniel. Okay, this is a public hearing. Debbie, what do we have signed up? We have David and Pamela Horses, and they're opposed. And it says they're on Teams. They're online. Okay. So, David and Pamela, are you there? You think they are there, or they were there? They're online. They're online? Okay. Well, we'll pause and get into where we can see them. And then uh, maybe we can see if we can get them unmuted. So David and Pamela, can you, do you know how to unmute yourselves? I'm not seeing, is this the D... C1 that looks like it's muted. Do we by any chance have them all muted? Can we unmute them all? They have to unmute themselves. They have to unmute themselves. Okay. Do you have a telephone number that you can text with them? Okay. I'll tell you what, while well, if you guys can work on that, if someone can text with them, we'll move on to the next uh, person signed up and we'll come back to David and Pamela. Uh, Jeff Hess, and he's in favor. Jeff, thank you for coming forward. You'll have three minutes, and if you could state your name again and your address. Uh, my name is Jeff Hess, uh, 35 North Hastings Drive, Nampa, Idaho, 83687. Our property is to the south of this contiguous. Um, I am in favor, uh, but there is a development agreement that I think needs to be tightened up a little bit. If you could bring up the drawing of the lots with the setbacks. Um, the main thing is around all around this is uh, flood irrigation. And this property was farmed and flood irrigated in the past. So, uh, uh, the one with the setbacks is easier. Uh, there's the setbacks on the east, west, and south are 15 foot, which the the existing ditches have to be tiled. Problem is having the right for the users to get in there and use those without uh, without having to go to court uh, and enforce their rights. So having a development agreement that provides for all of the water uses around there. The other thing is that because it's flood irrigated around there, that water runs off and it has historically run onto these properties. So uh, the design of that has got to be critical. And so the development agreement is, in its language, pretty broad. And I'd like to see it tightened up over uh, rights of the user, not just the association, but the individual users as well. Um, 
Uh, the other thing is they've requested a waiver on the grading of the sewer. Um, gravity uh, sewer runs to Stam on half the property and it grades to the south across my property, uh, which I bought at Orchard. Uh, I'd requested that that be looked at as a grade, uh, but they, were, they indicated that they didn't want to do that. I sort of disagree with their letter, but I, I don't have a problem with that waiver of that condition because I had proposed it at the Planning Commission. Um, so that really is the biggest issue is all of the water users around there um, and the design of the tiling of that and how the water gets off of the properties uh, on East West uh, that typically has been running into ditches on this property. So those are real critical uh, from a design standpoint. And if you don't have a tight development agreement, um, then we're gonna end up uh, having to fight with that over the, over the period of time. And I'll stand for any questions. Thank you for bringing those Thank issues you. forward. It's appreciated. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, so let's go back to um, the couple ahead. David and Pamela? Yes. So David and Pamela, I see that you're there. Are you able to connect? No. It looks like not, yes. If they're not able to connect, they have two letters in their pockets that might state the same thing. I don't know, just throwing that at Thank you. Were you able to reach them? Um, I'm texting them, but I'm not getting any response back. Okay, they may not see it. Okay, well, let's, we'll come back to them. So the next person is? Matt Drown, and he's in favor and he's here. Okay, thank you, Matt. And then Don Newell. And are you, is he in favor or opposed? In favor. In favor. Perfect, thank you. And is that everyone that we have signed up at the moment? Yes. Okay. So, um, Mayor, excuse yes. me. There was a Mike Boltman that signed up online. Did he say he did not want to speak or did he want to speak? He's online, so I didn't know if you wanted to give him the opportunity. Do you not have him on your list? I have him on the list. Okay, okay Mike that's Boltman all. is his name. Great. And yep, I'm, I'm here, can you guys hear me? We can, thank you. So could you state your name again and your address? Yeah, uh, Mike Boltman at KM Engineering, uh, 5725 North Discovery Way in Boise. I'm the uh, civil engineer in the project. And um, just here for any questions, if any of the neighbors have questions about the sewer, the gravity irrigation, um, just here to talk through those with you guys. Uh, just and going back to Jeff's question with the, the irrigation, we are planning to pick up the irrigation on the east side of the property and route it to the west side of the property. So we're not going to be impacting any of the gravity irrigation out there today. So what the neighbors get right now is what they're going to get in the future. Okay, thank you. Any further comments regarding uh, the sewer questions? Are you there? Oh, yes. yes. So there was a comment with the gentleman that came before you regarding sewer and how you're going to manage the sewer, the gravity flow. Yeah, so currently today the, the site is about, there's about a 20 foot differential from the north side of the site on Stam down to Orchard. So what we're planning to do with this development is we're going to be gravity flowing everything from north to south uh, taking it to a pump station on the south portion of the property. And then we're going to be force maining it back to the north, so under pressure, back up to Stam. Um, and that's due to the basalt on the site's only about four feet below grade. So we're really trying to limit how much we're cutting into that rock as much as we can. Um, we can definitely provide a stub to Jeff's property on the south side. It just won't be at a depth where he can gravity flow it to the pump station. Perfect, thank you for addressing that. It's appreciated. Council, do you have any questions at this time? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much. Appreciate your comments. 
Okay, so, and we have a gentleman, a gentleman, a, a lady here, and I am so sorry. Would you like to come forward and state your name and your address? And thank you for raising your hand back there, and I'm so sorry. I didn't see the sign-up sheet, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Uh, my name's Kathy Hinshaw, and I live on, at 925 North 52nd Street, would be east of the proposed site. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I oppose the Maple Leaf development, and um, I wanted to make a, uh, tell you about the school bus, how that travels. And it travels um, on STAM, because I was taking my grandchildren up to the bus, bus stop when they were living with us. And it travels um, from east to west. So that we had to cross the, cross the street and dodge all the, <laughs> all the traffic that was going to work. And so I just want to make that, so any children that were going to be, if they were, if that's developed, they would have to cross the street to go to Endeavor or any of the junior or high schools. And so I am, I brought up the CCNRs in my previous letters, and I do have a copy of them. And what they, I wanted to attach it earlier, but I didn't attach it to my letter. If you guys want to review them, I don't, I don't know. Well, are there any points that you would like to highlight in the CCNRs? Yes. Um, so there's, it's divided up into eight lots, and so I went and did my homework, and the lots are divided up in, from Stam all the way to Orchard, and all the addresses I posted, well, I put them in the little sheet here. So it goes, so that's for that, but there are some CCNRs that I wanted to bring up that But I had a real estate friend look up the CCNRs for, um, see if there were any for the ad two addresses that are um, proposed. And so he did find these. Okay. And they are valid as long as we enforce them. So I'm not sure as to why nobody else can find them. But so, I'm, so I guess what we'll do. Um, and they, did you have another point to make besides that? What we'll do is we'll come back and readdress CCNRs when um, the applicant okay. has an opportunity to close. Sure. So we'll ask that question and come back and readdress it. Yeah, because it looks like there's two different ones, but they're the same, same information. Perfect. Thank you. And was there anything else? Was that the main point for you tonight? No, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Okay. We have Pamela Caresis. Pamela, okay. You're on speaker, Pamela. Yes, hello. Thank you so much. I apologize about the inconvenience here. Uh, uh, we live at 4903 Stan Lane, my husband and I. And I want to let you know I really do appreciate the progress made from the original proposal. Um, it, it definitely is so much better. I just want to highlight uh, my main concern is the traffic. Uh, infrastructure has not kept up with the overwhelming growth or traffic on Stam Lane. Uh, considering everything that's going on around us, having residents living so close to grocery, retail, entertainment, I, I think the sidewalk and the crosswalk thing should really be looked at. I really think it's dangerous for anyone, especially children. Uh, and again, I just don't, I feel that traditional family homes would complement the area. Again, I know that 
the progress made on the original proposal is much better. But I let's embrace what we have and maybe this small little area can be kept as as a, a beautiful rural type of community that it is. Thank you. Pamela, thank you so much. We appreciate your testimony. <coughs> Excuse me. At this time, we do not have anyone else signed up to testify. So is there anyone here that had intended to testify tonight that had not gotten signed up? Seeing, uh, not seeing anyone, is there anyone online? Can you confirm is there anyone else online that had intended? Thank you. Now is the time for the applicant to come back and have the opportunity to address any comments that were made. And if you could come back and readdress the CCNR concerns. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think I'll probably start with Jeff's comments. Hopefully, Mike, our engineer's uh, testimony kind of helps to clear up a little bit of the issue with gravity sewer, the way that we talked about it during P&Z. Um, and then irrigation rights are... Uh, there's a state statute that makes it pretty strict and that we have to basically adhere to the way water is currently being enjoyed by folks. So we'll make sure that that happens. And then anything that needs to be added in the DA to make sure that um, Jeff and the other neighbors are happy with that, we'd be happy to comply with as well. Um, as far as the improvements along Stam Lane, um, we did have a traffic impact study completed as part of our initial application. It actually included more land in a lot more units. So it was about 117 units altogether. Uh, we've decreased that to 54. So our impact will be a lot less um, impactful than it was before. Uh, I think initially our traffic engineer had said that it was about 70 peak um, rush hour trips. So that would probably be decreased to about 40. Um, as far as improving property that's not in this development, I don't know how the developer would feel about doing that. Um, we'd certainly be happy to do anything on our property to accommodate what would make for safe pedestrian crossing and, and whatever else the city might require there. Uh, as far as Pamela's comment about traditional family homes in this area, um, I think in, most of the neighbors in the testimony that I've heard want one to one and a half acre lots, which is a wonderful product, but it's also not something that um, our developer wants to provide for the community, and it's also not consistent with the comp plan. So it would require a comp plan amendment and something that um, we're not proposing tonight. So we feel that we've come to a good concession here and a compromise that hopefully will work with the community. Um, and the CCNR, so I don't know if um, Christy can bring up my the image that I made, but we actually spent an afternoon looking just to make sure because I hadn't heard of the CCNRs before I read the public testimony before the last hearing. And um, one of the neighbors was kind enough to send over the version that she had. She's a real estate professional as well. So she looked and found the CCNRs that are applicable for the area. And it was, we had our uh, survey team look at it to make sure that the legal description for each of the lots that they described in those CCNRs and where they were applicable to. So I think it's the second to last slide or something like that. But they found that it was just for parcels one through four, the 1.7 acre lots, and then parcels one through four, um, 1.37 acre lots. So that's the division of lot five of the Orcalara Heights and a division of lot six of the Orcalara Heights. We also talked to our title company and made sure that there was nothing that was actually attached to our property or any CCNRs that maybe were missed with our initial due, due diligence. So I don't know if um, maybe the gal that's here tonight could show us the CCNRs that she has. Maybe they're different, but um, we did a fair amount of research into it just to make sure that there wasn't something we missed. So I don't know if there's more information maybe out there that we're not aware of, but I believe we've tried to cover most of our bases there. Um, I think that that might cover everything that was brought up. Yeah, I think, I mean, in general, we're excited about this project and excited to keep working with the city. So 
I think we'll stand for any questions if you have any. Thank you. And David, I don't think we got the CCNRs from the lady that came forward, so maybe we could get a copy of what you're going to give us. Um, in just in just a second, I'll have you bring those forward, and we'll give them to the clerk. So, Council, do you have any questions for Stephanie at this time? Councilman Haverfield. Just two. Um, the interior road, which is a private roadway, uh, will there be sidewalks on both sides? Madam Mayor, Councilman Haverfield, yes. It's on, I think, on one of our site plans. I can look really quick. It's on the perimeter of both sides. That's fine. There's just a common connectivity to Stan Lane. Yes, and with our initial application, we'd actually propose that too. I just think we hadn't clearly defined it enough. So, and then trash collection will it be a common uh, per lot, or will it be a common collection? Madam Mayor, Commissioner, or Councilman Haverfield, I'm not sure what the City of Nampa requires for that. I would assume, as far as trash collection, can they all have their own separate since they're separate properties? <coughs> or thanks, Christy. Uh, Mayor and Councilman Haverfield, that is a conversation to be had with Republic Services. Um, they have to work that out at the time of their de their plat layout to determine where um, the best access for Republic is, and then they work with them. So this might Thank impact you. your, your count if, if, if there's a common collection area instead of individuals. Yeah. Sure. Something to keep in mind. Yeah, no, that's something we'll And then the road width, at. the actual section, is it 25, 26 feet wide? I think curb it's... To curb? I think it's larger than that. Is it? Yeah, I think it's probably about 30. Let me. I apologize. I should have had that already. So on street parking, it's just the, the question. Uh, make sure that emergency equipment can get through the development if there's if it's prohibited for on street parking. Um, Councilman Haverfield, if it helps, um, at the time that they actually do the plat layout, the fire department will review all of that to make sure that it meets their standards. Um, right now this is just at concept level and so I don't know that they've dialed it into that detail quite yet. I like Thank to get you. the weeds, so I just, I'm going to ask the question so sure, that you're no, aware great. of it. Uh, going forward, some of these smaller developments like this, quite often you see cars parked on the street both sides, and it limits a, a emergency access through it. So uh, as long as the width is wide enough to provide uh, for on-street parking or if it's prohibited by ordinance or by your covenants. One or sure. The Thank you, uh, Councilman Haverfield. And that's something, too, I think I've seen before in other jurisdictions that they'll require red striping or... No parking signs. No parking. Yeah, so that would be if it's on one side. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank Council, you. do you have any additional questions for Stephanie? May I? Yes. Stephanie, uh, regarding the traffic, as we heard someone was concerned about that, and I totally get it because depending whether they're going to go out to Robinson at the end of Stan Lane or they're going to get on the Garrity, which is a uh, very packed area, um, and then what the mayor was saying about a hot signal. So when we go back to the traffic survey, as I was reading through it, was your number 70 trips per hour? I believe that's what you had said. Was that reflective of the addition of the fact that that was studied during COVID in August, which was still kind of in the major shutdown area? Was that allowing an additional 5 to 25% off that it said it could have been lower? Sure. Madam Mayor, Councilwoman Levi, yes, that was extrapolated to accommodate for the COVID numbers. And again, it was actually for more units as well. So I think we've basically halved our number of homes, and that'll help okay, thank too. You. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. If there are no other questions, then we could stand for a motion to close public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. What is the will of the council? Um, just a statement right now for council. Uh, again, my concern is is just the uh, the road frontage improvements, uh, cross access to an attractive area, which would be the Gateway Plaza, uh, and then circulation to the west to be able to get across the street. Uh, it would be nice if there was some way that that sidewalk could be extended, but we can't uh, mandate that. Um, I like the development as it's been uh, revised. Uh, the setbacks. 
on the perimeter, the fact that they're one-story homes that are uh, single-family homes with home ownership, uh, the interior lots as well being townhouses uh, with individual ownership, I think it would be a, a development with the park, park in there that would be attractive place to put. I just don't, I didn't ask and nobody else did as far as what the commercial use might be, but uh, that might satisfy some of the needs so that people don't have to leave the development. But uh, I wish there was better connectivity. Uh, the bus issue raised uh, I, something I hadn't even thought about. Kids have to cross over. So if there isn't some sort of a protective, protected way to get across the street, uh, that's going to be a potential hazard for those that are living there. So. <coughs> Maybe in time. Any other comments, Council? Just uh, Mayor, and I'm sorry, Jeff. I forgot your last name, but Jeff is the first name, correct? Anyway, what he mentioned, as far as I, I, I think I heard, as far as even tiling, the irrigation ditch, and so on. So if that's part of the DA, the development agreement, or what needs to be done, as far as included it when the motion is made. So. So I have, a, I have a question, and that really has to do with that sidewalk. I know it is county property. Um, can we um, put some type of stipulation in there to at least attempt the connectivity of the sidewalk to the apartment complex with, even though it, it is a county and they do not have to give right-of-way access or purchase it, but they may actually desire it? to have a sidewalk across along that road for walking purposes. I think what I, what I listen to from our citizens is that they say growth needs to fund growth. So in this case, to me, it is not the responsibility of the current landowner to put a sidewalk on their property to accommodate the growth that is going in right next to them. And so I'm just trying to think, how do you address that? Because it's very clear that our citizens are saying, let growth fund growth. And I know it's an additional cost, but is there a way to address that? Uh, Mayor, I guess I would have to look to legal to determine whether or not we could impose that kind of a condition when it applies to properties that are outside of our jurisdiction. Or, re or ask the question anyway, but yeah. Well, Madam Thank Mayor. You. I don't think the council can impose a requirement that's outside the developer's control. Um, you know, if it was available, but as long as it's not a mandate um, or a requirement that they have to have that sidewalk and have the approval of the neighbors, I think that would be inappropriate. But um, if the neighbors are willing, um, and that's that's optional, so to speak, if 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 the circumstances. Not a requirement. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Could a crosswalk be put from the entry over to across the road? I know it would, it, we can't put a hawk there, but there are other opportunities for a crosswalk um, that we see all over town. So is, is there an opportunity for a crosswalk um, without having to send people down into an area where there's not sidewalk back over? It just seems like we could probably... Daniel, I'm looking at you. If there's a crosswalk that could be put in to connect across there, not only for people wanting to access the services across the street, but the school bus. So as for the school bus, typically the policy for the school buses are that you stay on the side of the street that you live on, and when they stop and you they put the arm out, then the bus driver looks and calls the kids across. Um, so from that perspective, I don't know that that is something that um, would be of concern uh, just from, from the bus stop side of things. Um, as for placing a crosswalk at that uh, location, it's likely not a location that we would recommend a crosswalk at um, without some type of control on that. Um, the developer has indicated that if those property owners would be willing, he would be willing to um, put in that additional sidewalk if they are willing and or if there is room within the right-of-way. Um, and so that's certainly something that um, we he can attempt to talk to 
those property owners and if they're willing, uh, he would be willing to make that connection. Um, so that that's, I, I guess, what he would offer to, to uh, address the issue and the concern from the council. Mayor? Thank you. Yes. Um, I think I agree with Councilwoman Munchie. We, you got to put a cross, I mean, the, the entrance of that gateway is right there, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be, people are going to be crossing there. It's a huge development. There needs to be a crosswalk. Mayor, Councilman Bauer, crosswalks as a general rule, um, do they make the pedestrians feel safer, but do not always make them safer. Um, if a crosswalk is not utilized, um, if, there, if there's not a trigger for enough pedestrians actually crossing there, it tends to make the crosswalk pedestrians feel safer but the drivers tend to ignore it when they rarely see anyone using that. Looking at this, it, it, that's likely what I would see happening in this case. Um, if it's not here, then, then where? Well, my, my recommendation is crossing at the signal is the safest and um, best option in this situation. I was going to say the same thing. Without a hawk signal for a crosswalk, we're we're actually taking on the liability of providing something that's meant to be a safe passage, and it's not. Because there's no no stopping. There's no alert or signal. So the best best path is down to the light there to be able to get across. And without the mm -hmm. sidewalk, we're going to be back out walking on asphalt to try to get back into a sidewalk that's been put there at the corner. So. We really we have to try. We have to do a sidewalk, or we have to do a crosswalk and a hawk. Sidewalk would be the best way to go. And, and Mayor Thank Councilman you. Bauer, hawk signals are not inexpensive, and so they, for something of this nature, the volume of homes and the likely volume of pedestrian traffic would likely not warrant that type of expenditure. Um, I appreciate the fact that the developer is willing to do a sidewalk and to at least <coughs> access, and it's very likely that the neighbors, I would hope that they would be open to going ahead and allowing the sidewalk. Um, it's it's kind of a pain, but um, I think it would create a much more safe environment. Mayor, so, uh, yes. if it's okay, I'm just going to make the motion and we'll see what happens here. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and approve the application as stated with the conditions of approval as stated. Also adding that the uh, whatever needs to be done from an irrigation standpoint, that, that uh, is receptive to uh, Jeff and, and, and the other uh, residents in the area that use the irrigation. And number two, that the question definitely is asked by the developer to the landowners in the county whether they would allow a sidewalk uh, to, to the intersection with the understanding that if they do approve that and would allow that on their property, that the developer will be responsible for it. So did you um, remove all one E? Yeah, one E. Remove That's the, true. Uh, remove and remove one E. Right. Uh, and remove one E. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion from council? Seeing none, roll call. Whoop. Did you have? A no. sidewalk. Yes. Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Muchy? Yes. Levi? Yes. Coverfield? Yes. Bauer? Yes. And Brunner? Yes. Thank you for working with the neighbors, for listening, for the redevelopment, staying single level as you the backyards attach. Really appreciate the redesign. Thank you. A sky bridge would be okay too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, let's get through this next one before we take a break. I think I see someone standing at the back of the room. Are you the applicant on 6-3? On 6-3. So our next item is 6-3 uh, action item. This is a zoning map amendment from RPBC, which is residential professional to com community business to community business to allow a coffee shop. It's not you. So you've got one more to go. 
Okay, with a drive through at 16th Street North. This is for Wendy Shreif, JUB representing Thornton and Gallup. Thank you. Go ahead and restate. You know the, the drill, your name and address. All righty. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Wendy Sharif. I'm a planner with JUB Engineers, and my business address is 2760 Excursion Way in Meridian, Idaho, 83712. Um, I'm here this evening with what's essentially kind of a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, my applicant, who has already gone through design review with her project and worked with planning and engineering, um, we have a approximately 0.89 acre parcel where we have split zoning. Um, we have both RP and BC zoning for the parcel. And we would like to make sure that the entire parcel is zoned BC for community business. Um, the conference of plan designate, or the, the new zoning we're requesting meets the underlying conference of plan. Um, and we are well into the process for, for design for the site, but we do need to make sure we have the same zoning across this parcel. We are immediately contiguous to property of the north with the community business des designation and another property of the west. Um, we are planning a future coffee shop here in this location. So I think it'll be a great asset to the community um, and an investment here in the city of Nampa. So I'm here for any questions. Thank you so much. Are there any questions at this time? We'll have you back. Okay. Thank and you And we very may much. have a question at that time. Thank you so much, Wendy. Staff report. Thank you, Mayor. I was ready for her to give my entire presentation. Um, so uh, the, uh, as uh, Wendy had stated, the point of this is to kind of clean up the zoning uh, where the parcel is split zoned currently uh, to make the entire parcel uh, BC zoned. Some of the surrounding land uses to the north is a gas station, to the east are apartments, south there is a mix of residential and commercial uses, and then to the west is also another gas station. History, May this year, planning and zoning approved the uh, recommended approval of the rezone uh, with all the conditions of staff. Uh, June of this year, design review was completed and approved. Um, I won't go over that as Wendy is gone over the future land use, um, they will be stretching it, uh, community mixed use to cover this parcel. Utilities are all available and have adequate, adequate capacity. Uh, they have provided a, a queuing plan for the drive-through um, that's in your packet. Here's a concept plan. Um, this is what was uh, submitted for design review and was approved. Uh, here's the site plan. Uh, the BC zone, um, this is a permitted uh, use in the BC zone. Um, there's a large variety of uses. Uh, if they wish to not develop as this and go a different route, um, and those uh, uses are provided in the staff report. 1035 is our split zoning code where it uh, dictates that if a lot is split zone, then the more restrictive zone uh, applies for the entire development. Um, so that's the reason for uh, requesting the rezone here. Uh, the conclusions of law, um, I won't cover those. Uh, those are in your staff report as well. As far as staff analysis, uh, and it's in the public interest, increasing the amount of retail along corridors is reported as supported by the comprehensive plan uh, and can be benefit. San, uh, surrounding land uses would support the zoning change and incoming business. Um, there could be concern of for uh, overflow for the drive through, but the, uh, the queuing plan seems to uh, resolve any concerns there. Uh, as far as the zoning, um, split zoned as um, I have indicated uh, this would solve that uh, issue. Um, correspondence, typical correspondence from uh, engineering here. Um, all the right of way exists. Um, the um, they uh, looked over the queuing plan, and there wasn't any concern for uh, as far as traffic there. These are the uh, recommended conditions um, and any that you would like to add to that. And here's a potential motion for you. I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Parker. 
Are there any questions at this time? Okay, we may be back with questions. Thank you. So this is a public hearing, and we have a few people that are signed up. Um, and Debbie, I'll let you go through those names. Kelly Huff. Oh, so hi, this is Kelly. I'm just part of the development team. I have no questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Mike Moltman. Is Mike part of the team also? Okay. And then Wendy, and then I have a Craig Evert. I'm Craig Evert. I am the property adjacent to the facility. Would you like? Can I come in? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyway, I own the property next to the proposed Starbucks, and I'm strongly in favor of the rezoning. Great. Thank you so much for being here. And I believe we have your address listed. Debbie, you've got it? Yeah, 11th 6th Street and Harvest Hill. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you gave away the, the name. <laughs> well, I was guessing. There you go. Thank you. Okay, that's all we have signed up at this time. Is there anyone here or online that had intended to testify? Do we have any guests online? No? Okay. With that, this would be an opportunity for any the applicant to come back forward and any additional questions. Do we have any questions for the applicant or for Parker? Any yes. I do. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. There's a portion of the property that's being left um, available either for future expansion or for, um, I guess, grass area there on the other side that would be, would that be on the west side? Um, that big area there, yeah. So is mm -hmm. that planned for a future expansion or, you know? Um, Councilman Haverfield, that there are no plans for that parcel okay. at this time. For in the future. For expansion. Uh, yep. Just thinking as far as the, the parking requirement, circulation obviously would be what it is, but uh, there is a potential there if the setbacks are met that there could be an expansion to this building. So that would be the only I don't think I having a, a buffer is a bad thing um, to have that room, but but it's not, it's not, nothing is planned at this time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much. You I would much. stand for a motion to close public testimony. Hello. Second. All in favor? Aye. What is the will of the council? Yeah. I'm yes. to approve the zoning map amendment and sorry, RPBC to BC to allow a coffee shop with a drive through at 16th Street North and also address the 36th Street North AM.89 County Parcel. Um, conditions. With all conditions of um, all conditions of approval and conditions of law. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Roll call. Bruner? Yes. Levi? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Machi? Yes. There you go, and thank you. That is an excellent use for that. It is. So it's Wonderful. Good. Yes, thank you. So how soon yes. can my wife drive through and get a cup of coffee? <laughs> and it will be a Starbucks. How, how, how soon are you going to have That's it? That's great. I hope your neighbor gets the first cup. Yes. <laughs> yes, that is great. You can walk over there, Craig. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's great. We need that exit off the freeway with the new exchange. It's perfect. Okay, item 6-4 is an action item. This is a variance of section 10-8-6 requiring a 20-foot yard setback in order to construct a patio cover and carport at a reduced front yard setback of up to zero from the front property line. This is in an RS6 zoning district at 624 7th Avenue North for Jerry Visinor. Did I say that correctly? Probably not. Okay. Jerry, thank you for waiting. Go ahead and uh, share your name again and your address. Okay. Uh, my name is Jerry Visner, and uh, I reside at 624 7th Avenue North. And uh, we act, this is actually a duplex. Uh, I occupy the bottom floor, and the top is rented. And so uh, what we're trying to accomplish here is because upstairs and downstairs, neither one has a, a cover over the steps. And so for, it's a safety issue, you know, and 
my wife is a little older and she needs that you know protection so we're, our request is to go up to the property line and also uh, to uh, provide a, a covered carport as well so that's what we're proposing and hoping to accomplish <laughs> great thank you so much um, okay so we do have the pictures up here Thank you. So I'll tell you what, as you've just watched, it is a public hearing. I think we'll have staff come and do their report, and then we'll let you come back and answer any questions that we okay. might have. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Parker. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I think the variance request can be summed up um, from this picture here quite easily. Um, so as you can see, the property line in the front extends here, um, and it cuts through the staircase, actually. So the house sits right up close to that property line. So the applicant, as he stated, wants to cover those stairs with a, um, a structure, um, so that will be within that 20-foot required setback. Um, it's surrounded all by single family homes. The lot behind it was approved for a duplex um, here this year. Some history, um, it, this lot was approved for a duplex uh, in 2007, no issued permit there. In 2017, a building permit was issued to convert the basement to a separate dwelling unit. unit. Uh, included in those approved plans was a carport as well as the staircase that was leading to the basement that extended outside the property lines. Um, and that appears to be an error um, that we're, we're trying to correct now with this variance. Um, as part of the planning and final inspection, a uh, condition of occupancy was added that they complete the, uh, the carport for the renter, uh, as well as a garage for the owner uh, occupied unit. Um, and neither of those were constructed. Um, in February of 2018, CUP for the duplex was approved for that building. Um, in 2019, Occupy was permitted. Um, no garage or carport were constructed at that time. To March this year, uh, the owner applied for a building permit to construct uh, what he's presented today. Um, that permit is on, is on hold until we uh, solve this request. Here is the site plan uh, showing the property line in red, uh, the home here. And this is the carport that was on the original building permit uh, circled there. As you can see, the staircase goes up past the property line. Here's a image of the front of the home. Red line is the property line. Red lines of the property line here. This is a 1086C is the code requiring the 20 foot setback. Um, there's some exceptions to it where um, if homes on the street um, adjacent to it sit closer to uh, the property line, the 20 feet, that the home can exceed, extend within the 20 feet but cannot sit closer than 15 feet to the property line. Uh, variance, uh, applicable regulation, they need to show uh, undue hardship. Uh, purpose of the variance is to provide fair treatment. Um, individuals aren't penalized for the site characteristics beyond their control. Regulations, I won't cover these as uh, you are familiar with those. Correspondence, uh, building departments require a regulation, uh, both Title IV re building regulations. Uh, they also stated that the uh, they would need to meet fire code. The, um, the fire rating of that structure would have to meet code. Uh, they also stated that um, the structure would not be able to extend outside of the property line. Um, so as we have we've seen, the stairs extend outside of the property line, so the structure wouldn't be able to cover the last step of that staircase. Uh, engineering um, stated that the carport um, can, cannot be built over the utility line, um, but they would be um, 
open to an encroachment agreement to extend within the build within the easement. Uh, as far as the hardship, it does sit within the 20 foot setback. Um, the stairs were permitted to be built outside of the property line um, and it's uh, an encroachment agreement uh, was secured at the time for that staircase intrusion, uh, but a variance was never approved for that. Um, being in the R6 zone, lot is large enough for a duplex. Um, it does sit closer to this, the front property line um, than some other homes would. Um, as far as homes in these older parts of town, uh, most sit closer to that the property line than 20 feet. So this is a common thing to have variances come up for these homes. Um, as far as health and safety, uh, the structure wouldn't cover the last step, um, which seems uh, con contradictive to the safety, um, but the building department um, wouldn't permit that structure to cover the last step outside of their property. So uh, I've included some measurements. The front property line uh, is about 26 feet from the back of the curb. So most of that is right of way. Uh, staircase extends seven inches beyond the property line. The home is about 30 feet from the back of the curb. Um, and it's about four, the front wall of the home is about four feet from the property line. Um, the variance is also for the carport, which was never built, um, for that to be built in the same uh, front plane as the home currently is. So it wouldn't sit closer to the property line than the home is. It would have to meet or be behind the home. The conditions of approval are those in the staff report. Um, I think I've covered most of those. And here's a potential motion for you and I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Parker. Are there any questions for Parker? Councilman Haverfield. Okay. I always have a question. Uh, there's a photograph in our um, packet of the front of the house. Can you go to that? Just trying to understand what they're hoping to accomplish. Right now, there's a cover over the front door. They're, looking, they're wanting to put a cover over the sidewalk to the left of the front door. I believe the cover, uh, Councilman, would cover both sets of stairs. So okay. this one. So there currently there's one that's covered. So that would be rebuilt possibly, I don't know. But uh, So the roof slope would be directed to the two sides, just like the current roof slope is, correct? So you're not correct. contributing water into the right of way. Correct. Okay. And then the uh, carport structure would be built to the left side of the photograph? It would be, yep, to the left side. Mm -hmm. And that would not uh, be any further forward than the front of the current house. Correct. So uh, it's in non-compliance at this point, but it's an existing condition. So all they're asking for is the ability to, to cover that one little portion of the uh, stair, in a sense, because the other side's already covered. Um, the variance is to cover the majority of the stairs except for the last step of the staircase. As long as the eave can't extend beyond the property. Correct. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you, Parker. So this is a public hearing and we do not have anyone other than the applicant that is signed up to testify. Is there anyone here that had intended to or online? Seen no one. That's this is an opportunity for the applicant to come and present any additional information or for counsel to ask the applicant any questions. Are there any questions for our applicant or for Parker? I don't think we have any other questions. Okay. Okay. I would stand for a motion to close public hearing. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. What is the will of the council? <laughs> Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the variance of Section 8, 1086, requiring a 20 foot front setback. With conditions, yeah. With conditions of approval for Jerry Dismuro. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Turner? Yes. Levi? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Bauer? Rodriguez? Yes. Machi? Yes. It was a long time to wait for that, but you got it done. 
So now you can accomplish what you're wanting to. Thank you so much for your patience. And, you know, Council, I'm going to see if we can just push through and so we can get done. So we're going to move to item 6-5 on the agenda. This is an action item. This is a variance of section 10-1-8.D.1, limiting a residential fence height to six feet on the perimeter of the backyard. This is to allow a vinyl fence extension of an additional 18 to 20 inches to provide privacy from a neighboring property, which sits at a higher elevation in an RS6 single family residential area. This is at 4453 South Gabriel Way for at, at Lava Spring subdivision for James and Charlene Moss. And uh, are you James? Hello, I am. The, okay, so our applicant is here. Thank you. So, and then is your address the 4453? Correct, 4453 okay. South Gabriel Way here in Nampa. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we're here to ask for a variance for the uh, fence extension. Um, a little history. We moved into the Lava Springs development. We bought our lot in 2018. Um, at the time, there was only three other homes on our street. Um, so when we had the house built, we had a vinyl fencing, six foot enclosing our property. Uh, there was a house to the rear that had a current fence. So we matched that fence. In November, December of 2020, the lot directly to the south of us, which is the front of our home. Um, our home is actually set back off of the roadway. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner, um, part of our backyard aligns the new house that was built in 2020. Uh, when that house was being built, we noticed that the foundation appeared to be higher than ours. You know, we thought it was an optical illusion. We waited once the house got built and that um, back corner that you can see of the house is their patio. We uh, realized that the house is about two feet higher than our house. So you can see by the photo that the slope, the grade, uh, the house does sit higher. So we did a little um, comparison of our property fence line. Um, I had my son and myself, we stood on their patio. My son's about 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, my wife, who's about 5'4", was in our side yard, and we were able to see, she was able to see us from the waist up, extending over our original six-foot fence. Um, you can kind of see in the uh, picture that's in the middle, um, part of the construction that I started, I took a photograph to show that door that you see there, that's a construction door, but that door is my neighbor's bedroom. It goes right out onto their patio. It is currently a um, clear glass door. So while standing in our side yard, we have a clear view of our neighbor's bedroom and their patio. Um, I did not do any research um, for the city council or on the code. Uh, previous cities that I've lived in have allowed fence extensions. So I just went ahead and contacted a local company. They informed me how to extend the fence, and I extended the fence. Um, the reason why I did it, um, it for privacy. The fence that we currently have on our other side of our house and the back of our house allows us the typical standard privacy you would expect with a six-foot fence. This current six-foot fence, due to the um, change in height of our properties, does not allow us that same uh, expectation of privacy that we have with the other six foot fences. That fence extension that um, I put is approximately 18 to 20 inches. Um, we did a bunch of comparison and that was the height that we felt gave us that expectation of privacy that was equal to the other six foot fences. So if I think I understand you correctly, you've already done it. You're just now needing to get permission to, to have done it. You found so, out afterwards that you needed a variance. Is that right? Correct. We got um, our HOA, we were told, turn us in uh, to code compliance. Code compliance oh. came by and knocked on our door, and that's when we realized that we were in violation of the city code. Okay. So they, they walked us through, told us how we can apply for an exemption or variance. Perfect. Thank you. Hence, I mean, while you were here, I mean, yes. Quick, quick. So is your HOA in, unhappy with you with this extension? So our HOA... Um, they turned you has, in, I'm guessing they, have, they are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm guessing they are if they turned you in. Cool. Well, that's what we were told, but I've been told by my HOA president and vice president that they're in favor of this. Um, I have a 
a lot of neighbors who are all, they love the way the, the look of it is and the privacy. Because there's, in our development, there's a lot of homes that are all off different heights. So there's a lot of privacy issues when you're on your patio. Um, I've had a lot of neighbors come by and ask me if I can do it for them. And I said, well, no, I can't <laughs> because it's not allowed. So, um, may, Mayor, uh, if I may, my, my main interest is your neighbor that you did this because to give them an, actually a little more privacy, too. So are they happy with this? So they are. As a matter of fact, they just moved in a month and a half ago. Okay. And um, they were getting ready to run a fence down that property line coming this direction because that's their property. And uh, I told them, no, you can't go that tall. So I informed them of, of what happened. Um, so they're all in favor. They appreciate that I did it. And they may come in for a variance. <laughs> you might well see them in for a variance also. I was going to say, we may need to address this to where not every single person needs to come in. In fact, we should authorize staff so it doesn't have to come before city council. Totally agree. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. And Rodney, how fast can you make this staff report? Like two and a half minutes. Or one. <laughs> yeah, just keep it short. I don't know that we, yeah. All right, I'm, I'm not gonna go over it. There was the location, I think you're all familiar with the location of that subdivision. Um, comprehensive plan, it, it fits there. Uh, there's an aerial view of the property, and I think the one to the south is the one that uh, was recently constructed, um, if I'm correct. There's the condition, 72 inches is the max height uh, in a residential zone. Um, you need to show undue hardship. So just quickly, variances are intended to not be for a special exception. So you don't want to come in, uh, you don't want to grant variances for special situations just because they're asking, right? There has to, sh you have to show some kind of condition that makes it not fair to them. And uh, that's a really, a really high level um, perspective on, on variances, but it's not intended for just anybody who comes in to grant a variance. However, the conditions in this situation, uh, a greater elevation of the property next, next door, um, it's a pretty good case for, for those conditions that would warrant a, a variance. So no impact or comment from correspondence from anyone. Uh, I outlined that I felt like the potential hardship is there. Um, it's up to you to decide, of course, but uh, recommended conditions, 92 inches in height. And then last of all, I just wanted to say that uh, to your last comment, um, that staff already did make changes to the code as proposed in our workshop. And so once that code amendment goes through, these kind of situations, specifically this one, would not have come to city council once once this goes through. So we're ready to go as soon as that goes through and, and gets adopted. Uh, you won't see these kinds. And how long before that's adopted, though? <laughs> I have a meeting with the um, Building Contractors Association tomorrow. So I was really happy to, to get that meeting with them. And that's the only thing that's holding us back now. And so I've scheduled it. I don't remember the exact date, but I think it's in, um, I think it's in August that uh, we've scheduled that meeting for. So Perfect. that first meeting, which is planning and zoning, and then it'll go back to city council right after. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you, Rodney. Yes. Uh, just a question. Uh, it had a uh, retaining wall been built underneath the fence and the fence built on top of it to gain the same height. Would we even be having this conversation? Uh, we would. A retaining wall, it dep um, so it doesn't, if you looked closely at the uh, pictures, you can see that the, it's not actually retaining any ground here. It's just that the slope of the property goes up to the building. But if they would have built a retaining wall to, right. to basically balance it out, would they have poked a fence on top of it of six feet without any so issues? It, it depends. If, if, a property, um, like if a property next door is higher right. and they pull the permit currently, they could build a six foot fence. Oh. It has to be yes. a neighbor pulling the fence. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh. All right. That makes sense. Any other questions for Rodney? Rodney, thank you. That was yes. quick. Good job. <laughs> okay. This is a public hearing, and I don't see that anyone has signed up to testify in support of or in opposition to. Is there anyone here that had intended to testify 
or anyone online. Seeing no one, this is an opportunity for the applicant to say anything, last comments, or counsel to ask any questions. I don't see a thing I would stand for a motion to close public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. What is the will of the council? Mayor. I move to approve the variance of section 10. One limiting on the residential fence height to eight to six feet on the perimeter of the backyard at four four five three South Cabra Way for James and Charlie Moss with all proposed conditions in the staff report. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Roll call. Bruner? Yes. Levi? Yes. Everfield? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Hutchie? Yes. And thank you for your patience tonight that you had to sit through all of this to get there. But now you're official, yes. <laughs> I, I need some fence improvement. Are you out for hire? Out for hire? Okay. 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 Good for thank you. you thank you. Um, you can take a quick break. I'm just going to keep going because it'd be nice to go ahead and get done this evening. So actually, the next item on the agenda is our staff report. Jeff, thank you. Do you guys, do we need a break? Because we've only got a couple of action items left. We're almost done. Oh, man. This, this side said, who, who said let's hang in there. Who just whined? That was Jeff and Jacob. <laughs> Actually, Todd. OK, Jeff, you're on. <laughs> Mayor, City Council, a brief update from the Public Works Department. I uh, just want to tell you that we're having a successful chip seal program this year. And uh, uh, has, has anyone seen a bad chip seal before? Well, then it hits the windshield. I think <laughs> right. that we saw one in a county next door to us. Maybe. That, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and actually, a few years ago, we hired a company to come in and do chip seal. And it was uh, a mess. And so I remember cars tracking in to their driveway, um, oil onto their driveway. I remember kids having on their shoes, walking in their front door. A bus let out one time, and the traffic control folks out there let them walk across the road. So what we've seen a bad chip seal, I just want to highlight what a really good one looks like. And that's our, that's our street department. So I'm not just saying this. Uh, they're really good at what they're doing. And they have tweaked the process so it is very clean. We didn't get, an, we didn't get another claim for a cracked windshield this year so there. well um, so we're doing arterials and subdivisions we added the subdivisions after that project I was referring to we said we needed to have better quality control so we asked a street department to do residential neighborhoods too and that was three years ago so they the residential neighborhoods is awesome right now when you go through it uh, so just a quick chip seal process first that they're doing the crack seal if you can see that on the left and then you see how they put a cover over the existing castings out in the street to protect those the oil application and chip seal. Uh, Sean runs the chipper, stayed four hours one night and tweaked it again. So they, they have 25% of the rock or less. So it almost looks like a finished product without them even sweep, sweeping now. Um, so there's some of the handwork with the compaction and sweeping. And um, the fog coat is next, and that will be coming over the next month. And then we'll start striping them the, the um, couple weeks after that. So you see the quality of that finished product looks really good. And there has been communities who have gotten rid of chip seal because it's just a mess. Uh, but the way they do it, people are actually requesting it in the, in the neighborhoods now. Um, and then the mayor came out this year, so thank you, mayor, for your support. You got up on the chipper. I'm sure they asked you to drive the thing, too. They always try to talk me into that, but I... I don't think that they, they didn't do offer. They didn't, I didn't think they would that. Me. <laughs> okay. um, and then I just want to give a quick uh, highlight about our transportation funding. So that's kind of the good. The, the challenge we're still dealing with, but we've made some progress. Um, there was a $17 million per year funding deficit. That's when we, that's when we finished the transportation master plan. Um, and a $200 million unfunded uh, maintenance backlog. A huge issue, the city, um, but we are making progress. So quick, quickly, two focus areas, local, and that's our FY19 funding plan that we proposed, we had, we had before the council, and we're still working that. And also there's a state um, part of that, and we're looking at road levy adjustments, gas tax adjustments, and state transportation dollars. All of that we're seeing momentum on a, on a um, regional and a statewide. Um, this is the progress since FY19. We had a six-time impact fee increase. 
Um, thank you for your support through that. That has been huge. Uh, we're, we are leveraging that impact, the impact fee dollars to build intersections right now. We want to get the intersections done first, and we'll start to widen the roads out. The 1% property tax in FY19, we appreciate that too. That, was, that is um, part of the plan. And then we went after the registration fee, if you can remember that. Uh, it was a lot of work. Um, I'm counting it up as, as uh, progress too. We got to know a lot of the different cities in Canyon County. They're, all the cities are in the same situation. They just don't know it. Their downtowns are falling apart and there's no transportation funding. And that's what it's like statewide too. Um, so on this, we're just giving you the next phase where we're at right now is the 1% um, increase, which is what we're requesting again. So we keep the local progress going. Um, the GO bond reallocation is coming up in 2024 and 25. And then we're going to be hitting this year statewide, um, statewide adjustments to the allocation of money. So uh, AIC, we spoke at AIC, Tom and I did. There were several cities there that heard it. We're meeting with AIC as a group of cities um, statewide, and we're going to uh, make progress on adjusting the distribution of transportation money, and it it'll, it'll change Nampa if we get this adjusted. Um, there's some streets in Nampa that haven't seen work in 30 years, and that's true across the state. While the highway districts and the state have much, much better asphalt and roadway maintenance. Um, so this is our goal, and you probably remember this, um, this graph, we're still using it. So uh, with that, um, stand for any questions. I want to mention Holly Street uh, in front of NNU. The plan is to, the plan, one of the plans, go from four lanes to three lanes. We're going to start a public outreach, a survey starting on Monday. It's going to open for two weeks, and we'll get more input from um, the people in that area and the community. So we'll have that information back to you. Uh, Mayor, if I may. So, Jeff, are you hearing? I mean, and we're hearing from a federal standpoint, of course, this infrastructure and, uh, you know, if that ever gets through. So, what it, do you have any idea, a hearsay or whatever rumors, what that would mean for municipalities if, if that uh, whatever trillion, how many trillion that is actually passes? Yeah, and it depends on how it's distributed. distributed. But right now, we get the short end of the stick on how distribution goes through the state and funnels down to the cities. So I think we would get dollars from that. So it would go to Tril state first and the state then and, and then counties and then would right. decide how, how that money is distributed. Yeah. So and to give you an idea, Councilman, $512 million come in, comes into the state. The city split $12 million of that. So $512 million comes in the state. The city split $12 million right now for the highway distribution account. So it's, it's, it's antiquated. You know, so have we, have we talked years to our old. state senators at all about this? Uh, we have had involvement with our state senators, and we're getting backing from that. So We will continue to do so. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, Jeff, you've done a phenomenal job. You know, as I was sitting here thinking, you know, as mayor, you're also the city manager, right? The administrator, whatever. You, you need to do it. And what I'm sitting here thinking is, you know what? Lead and get out of the way because we've got a great team. Right, and that's yeah. my job, is to lead, but get out of the way and let these guys go, because Jeff's doing a phenomenal job. And actually, I think we're leading the state when it comes to a new look at how we fund transportation across the state of Idaho. And so, great job, Jeff. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Excellent. Mayor and council. Thank you. Okay, so we're ready for item 5.5 five on the agenda. This is an action item, and this is to authorize the mayor to sign the contract in the amount of $199,980 with Garland DBS for roof replacement at the Fleet Services Building. This is going to be a budget amendment because it's a little bit out of budget, and it was reviewed by legal. So are there any... We can let Patrick talk to us about it. Are there questions for Patrick? Have yes, have Andy. questions. Uh, local applicator? It, this is a piggyback contract off an Omnia uh, cooperative purchasing contract. Right. So who's, uh, who's going to be the installer? Of the uh, Roman Roofs. It was competitively bid by Garland. Roman's and local? Roman is local. They, they got two responsive local bids. Roman was the low bid. Okay. And, uh, I'm sorry, is this a modified roof? What type um, of roof is it? No, it's a it's a TPO roof. Oh, it is. Okay. Does it include insulation then? It does. It, it's taking it all demoing all the way down to the roof deck. Uh, the contingency that you see 
above and beyond the contract is for roof replacement. The roof is 36 years old. Uh, we've had numerous leaks over the years and, and been patching it, uh, you know, for many years since I've been here. Okay. And, uh, and so it's taken all the way down, and uh, we're hoping there's not a ton of uh, wood deck to replace, but we think there'll probably be That's about fine. 10%. And the pricing includes bonding and insurance? Yes, any any project over $50,000 will require bondage uh, based on state statute. Okay, I'd, I'd make the motion to approve this uh, request to, this evening as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I need a question. So no no lo local bidders as far as came, came, came across as far as with bids on this? Uh, Mayor and Councilman Brunner, uh, Garland is a national company, and we access them, and, and they solicited local bids with two responsive bidders in the area, and Roman Roofs was the lowest responsive and, and bid. Just could, process wise, could I explain? So I feel a little bit responsible for this. So um, the first time this came through, I asked those exact questions. I was very concerned about going with a national contractor, and I asked us to rebid it local and separate it out, and it didn't work. And we didn't end up, actually the bids came back higher from the subcontractor. I think I'm remembering this correctly, but the very thing I was hoping to accomplish by going local and not going national actually ended up costing us more money. So then we had to go back, and overall the project is now more expensive because of the time delay. And what we have are the people that uh, we would have wanted to bid local are working through the national company. And so it is a piggyback bid off of a national bid, and we tried that, but it actually worked against us in this particular case. Because so I, Mayor, yeah. Patrick, is, is this a formula where that you think we're going to be using ongoing? Well, um, Process Mayor right? and Councilman Brunner, we used this in 2019 for the replacement of the Family Justice Center roof and all the HVAC equipment. Uh, it was very successful. We end up getting some just cost estimates uh, preliminarily, and that's the first time we've used Garland for that. I think that we would use them primarily just for roofing since that's all they do. And, um, and we also just, we use piggyback contracts also for cubicle furniture, you know, things off the state contract. So it would be really limited to this type of project. Uh, so bottom line, how Garland, uh, Garland is making their money is just quantity. They're doing projects all over Volume. the place. That's why they're, they're cheaper than a local who's not, you know, where they're, where they're hiring the subcontractors rather than. Right, and most of the of the uh, school roofs that you'll see in the Treasure Valley, uh, you know, a large percentage of those are being performed by Garland with local roofers as well. All right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I forgot to ask. As far as, was there an abatement study, an asbestos study in the roof of Jamie Mastics or anything? Uh, yes, we looked at that, and there's just a little bit in the mastic, and that's included in the bid. It's for. Yeah, it's uh, it's outside, so basically they just have to wet it, scrape it, and, and bag it, and mark it. And the price includes uh, the trip to the landfill with the product. Uh, so we don't have to worry. About this is an all-inclusive design and construction contract. It covers everything with a, a guarantee not to exceed costs. Okay. So if there's anything above and beyond other than the allowance that we have in there. Uh, for a unit price for deck replacement, they're going to cover any other overages. Okay. Okay. There was a any further? Motion. There was a yes. There was a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez. Yes. Bruner. Yes. Levi. Yes. Bauer. Yes. Machi. Yes. Haverfield. Yes. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. Item 5-6 is an action item. This is authorizing staff to distribute $155,207.66 for wastewater connection fees, uh, GL to Title I, to cover the uncollected Birch Latecomers fees for 370 new homes built between the spring of 2018 and April of 2021. So moved, Mayor. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? A question, Mayor. So uh, if I may, Daniel. So where in your mind the Holtons come up with eight hundred thousand to a million dollars uh, reimbursement? Mayor uh, Councilman Bruner, that is the the one hundred and fifty five is just the uncollected fees that we should have collected between that period that the software didn't populate. Um, the Holtons 
um, numbers of what they are owed for the entire, or what their account balance is for their portion of the latecomers uh, includes that 350-ish uh, original principal, and then they have the 9% interest over that time period since 2006 when the agreement went in. So place. they have been getting on an ongoing basis some reimbursement. And this is, but is this, this is the final? No, this mm -hmm. is a totally separate issue, and so okay. this is a totally separate okay. motion, so I'm, and I'm, it's I'm, not I'm, I'm related off, to that. off base, okay. We, we if you don't mind me working. saying so, so I think we should stay strictly to this particular action item. So, so that that's an, on, an ongoing. We are still researching yes. some of the mm -hmm. information council requested I, on that. I will yes. I'm done with my discussion. I thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none. Roll call. Bruner. Yes. Muchi. Yes. Levi. Yes. Bauer. Yes. Haverfield. Yes. Rodriguez. Yes. Item five seven and five eight are the first reading of ordinance for annexation of property into the Municipal Irrigation District of the City of Nampa for real properties listed in Exhibit A and direct the City Engineer to alter the use and map area accordingly. And it is uh, item 5.8 is to authorize the summary of publication for the preceding ordinance and it is requested to pass under suspension of rules with the summary. An ordinance of the City of Nampa Canyon County, Idaho, annexing a portion, a portion of the underlying irrigation district in the Municipal Irrigation District of the City of Nampa, County of Canyon, State of Idaho, and the changing the boundaries thereof and directing the City Engineer to alter the use and area map accordingly. So moved, Mayor, as read, with suspension of rules and publication. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Muchi? Yes. Levi? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Bruner? Yes. Item 5-9 is an action item to authorize the mayor to sign a resolution <coughs> to adopt the post-construction stormwater management plan and O&M and, o and M agreement, which has been reviewed and approved by legal. So moved. <coughs> Excuse me. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Muchi? Yes. Levi? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Yes. Item 510 is to is an action item to authorize the engineering staff to proceed with negotiations for right-of-way acquisition for Kings Road and Victory Road roundabout project and authorize the mayor to sign the right-of-way acquisition contracts up to the estimated amount of $750,000. This is approved in the FY21 budget. So moved. Second. They were just waiting for you to stand up. Is there any further discussion or any discussion? Roll call. Muchi? Yes. Levi? Yes. Haverfield? Is this by Jean's house? <laughs> It'll all be by my house. I'm sure that I told you. We got a cheers in the paper on this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'll vote yes. Bauer? Except yes. with Jean. But... Rodriguez? Yes. Bruner? Yes. <laughs> it's always great to get a cheers in the newspaper. I didn't see that. Thank you. That's great. Item 511 is an action item. This is for council to award the bid and authorize the mayor to sign a contract for Midland Boulevard and Greenhurst Road turn lanes project with Idaho Materials and Construction in the amount of $285,457.84, and it is approved in the FY21 budget. Mayor, question, if I may, Mrs. Daniel. So this is also one of the uh, recommendations by Jeff and his team as far as for a roundabout eventually, right? Eventually. Um, we. So this is just to get us by, or I guess I'm just talking about money mm -hmm. as far as uh, doing something now, and this is not going to affect the cost of the roundabout? I mean, where are we? we... No, Mayor, Councilman Bruner, this is a interim solution. The, inter the full intersection improvements at this intersection are a ways out. Um, with the additional development that we've seen out there, uh, we've seen the need um, for this, and so uh, that's why this so, project so moved, was as stated. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Roll call. Seems that it's not a roundabout. Yeah. <laughs> Roll call. Rodriguez? Yes. Machi? Yes. Levi? Yes. Haverfield? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Bruner? Yes. In that the public hearings are finished, the next item is unfinished business, and we have no items there. 
and then uh, section eight are pending ordinances that are noted just for future reference. And um, at that, I believe we have, have completed the regular portion, if I can talk, of our meeting. And I would ask for a motion to adjourn into executive session pursuant to Idaho Code 742061-1J to consider labor contract matters authorized under section 7426A1, 1F to communicate with legal counsel for the public agency to discuss legal ramifications of and legal options for pending litigation or controversies not yet to be litigated, but imminently likely to be litigated. Oh. It's hard to go through them all. And then 1C to consider acquiring an interest in real property not only.